Welcome back to the Demystify Sci podcast. I'm Anastasia. I'm Michael Shiloh. And today with us, we have Jeffrey Drum of the YouTube channel Land of Chem, who has a really interesting theory about ancient Egypt, where instead of treating these massive pyramid complexes as being burial chambers, which is the conventional explanation, he proposes that they're actually chemical manufacturing plants. And it sounds, on the face of it, kind of like a stretch, but Jeffrey has done so much work on primary data, on visiting the sites, on reconstructing the insides of what's inside the temples and connecting them to a pretty thorough understanding of the chemical manufacturing of things like sulfuric acid, uh, ammonia fertilizer. I mean, in general, when you read about ancient history, the term metallurgy crops up all the time. And it's just sort of glossed over. But when you think about the processes necessary, it's not just about melting a rock down and hammering it into something usable. There's a great deal of chemical cooking that goes on. Processing. There you go. And so that's really what all of this work sums to is how were the ancient peoples able to do this complex metallurgy? And chemistry seems like the proper answer to that question. Over the course of four hours, Jeffrey walks us through the deep details of his investigation. He talks about all of the chemistry, all of the architecture, all of the difficulties of doing this work. He invites us to Egypt, which, you know, would be amazing. Uh, And And he's got some beautiful figures, too. So if you're just listening, we're doing our best to describe them. But you can also come check them out on YouTube or, you know, if you're on Spotify, you should be able to see some of the figures there, too. And at the end of the day, it's hard to say if this was exactly what the temples were used for, but the evidence is certainly compelling that, at the very least, our understanding of these pyramids as burial chambers is woefully incomplete relative to the evidence that is available. So enjoy the conversation. If you really like it, leave a comment. If you don't like it, leave a comment. Uh, Tell your friends about the podcast because we grow best through word of mouth. And if you've done all of those things, consider joining our Patreon. We have a weekly patron chat where we can get together. And really, I think it's turning into a place where we learn to talk. What does it mean for a group of, you know, 10, 15, 20 people to get together and have a conversation? And so we're perfecting the art of conversation there. We're also exploring the ideas that we kind of, that we touch on in the podcast, but that people are interested in exploring new facets of them. People who have similar interests are connecting, and so they're starting to go off and form friendships off of it. It's a really active, very exciting group of people that if you join the Patreon, you can come join. And I think that that's it. Enjoy the conversation, and we'll see you next week. The scientific revolution starts now. So I remember, you know, I'm a, I'm a 1985 baby. Um, so I remember very distinctly with my father growing up as a kid watching, you know, Raiders of the Lost Ark and Indiana Jones. You know, these type of films where I was very inspired by adventurous archaeology in the pursuit of ancient secrets and, you know, living a life of mystery and intrigue and adventure. And fast forward many, many years into the future, my first trip to Egypt was in 2017. And I had been investigating for almost five years, I guess, starting around 2012. You know, everybody went through this spiritual revolution. It was the end of the Mayan calendar, the beginning of the dawn of the age of Aquarius. Everyone was going through this kind of spiritual reformation. And I myself experienced that as well, where my mind was coming open to all these different things. And I started getting into sacred geometry and I started developing my own ideas about spirituality and God and all of these things. And I also started simultaneously investigating the alternative functions or the theories rather about the alternative functions of the Great Pyramid. Because there's a lot of researchers that focus specifically on the potential function of the Great Pyramid. So I was looking into a bunch of of these theories. And in 2017, I had a a gift from God. I I really believe in God, the almighty creator that's given me the opportunity to do this. And I actually had a near-death experience somewhere almost 10 years ago um, that completely changed my life and put me on the path of what I've now become to fulfill the destiny I feel like I've always put here to become. So investigating the theories about 
the Great Pyramid producing electricity. I was working for an IT company at the time and I got hit with a massive commission check. I had bro just broken up with a girlfriend and I was like, all right, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to do something that I always wanted to do and go on this crazy adventure to Egypt. So I had this big fat commission check that paid for my flight and my trip and my tour and all this stuff. So I put my boots on the ground to come to Egypt in 2017. And I was intent on investigating the great pyramid to see if there was any legitimacy to that hypothesis of the production of ancient electricity. But one of the first things that I discovered here was a collection bowl at Abu Sir. And this collection bowl is connected to a red granite conduit that runs from the base of the adjacent pyramid underneath a temple that has this gorgeous black basalt floor. And the red granite conduit spits out into this miraculously carved, just exquisite red granite collection bowl. And the conventional story is that this is a collection bowl for drainage water, which that never really resonated to me as being true, because if you're just draining water off of a site, you don't then collect it in this, you know, exquisitely carved, very rare stone that came from 500 miles away and you don't collect drainage water. It's like, you know, the, the drainage pipes off the side of your house, it runs into a you know, canal somewhere, or you can just drain it directly back into the Nile river, which is adjacent to all of these structures. So the first thing that popped in my head was, well, this is for collection of chemicals. And I don't know where I received that information from the Akashic records or whatever you want to call it. But this idea was given to me by the universe. And then we take a trip inside the red pyramid of Dashur, which you mentioned before, and there's chemical staining all over the walls inside of these chambers. And there's a very intense smell of ammonia coming from the mm. third and final chamber. And so, of course, my mind was firing when I was inside of this thing. And I was like, okay, so these things aren't producing electricity. They were used to produce chemicals on an industrial scale. So that was 2017. I then came back after developing the theory, publishing my first book in 2020. I came back during the middle of the pandemic. I came back in 2021, 2022, and now <laughs> 2023, I have fully moved to Egypt and I'm living here permanently. And I know back in 2017, the first time my feet hit the sand, it's like the movie Dune. I don't know if you're familiar with the Dune series or the remake of the movie Dune. When he first comes to the planet Arrakis, his feet hit the sand and he knew that he would live there forever. That's like very much my testimony to the first time I, I went to the desert. I was like, oh, this is it. And this is where I want to spend the rest of my life. So was again, it like, kind of did, so like just to back that up a little bit, did it yeah. feel, <laughs> did it feel to you like, did you feel like the ex extant explanations for the Egyptian architecture and the, the relics of what remains were inadequate? Did it, did they feel like what, what pushed you into even imagining and being entertained by the theories that there was perhaps advanced technology or things that have yeah. somehow escaped the archaeological narrative? Yeah, so there, there is a lot of what appears to me to be functional architecture inside of these structures when compared to some of the known burials, for example, in the Valley of the Kings down in Luxor, these are very accessible burial structures with large, you know, 15 to 20 foot high entrances that are very, very wide, very gradual slopes leading down into these very large burial chambers. And the burial chambers are just large rectangles and they're all ornately decorated to literally speak that this is a tomb and this is a burial. Well, when investigating the Egyptian pyramids, there's a whole bunch of additional engineering that went into designing these structures that is indicative of a function. For example, if you were looking at a car engine, for example, you know, all of these components have functional designs and those designs are very intentional. So even when I started to investigate these things, I knew that one day that I would follow a path of trying to figure out what these machines were doing, because as I mentioned before, these structures are encoded with ancient knowledge, whether it be geometry, mathematics, astronomy, astrology, whatever you want to call it. Um, they're also encoded with this functional engineering that can be reverse engineered. Mm. And, and we're talking about like huge chambers, right? Like we're talking about these huge, oh, yeah. uh, I don't even, I don't have a number to stick on them, but they're connected by different conduits too, which is very strange in addition to the, 
you know, hallways from which you would normally access them. There's there's conduits, and the way that you lay it out uh, in some of those animations, I'm sure we'll get to later, is is uh, it, it really does seem to have this uh, piping feel to it. Correct. Yeah. Chambered yeah. chambers and piping. Yeah. And so I remember very distinctly, you know, during my 2017 trip, I'm talking with my friend that went with me, and you know, I'm speculating about okay, there, there. If you take laboratory chemical apparatus you know, a reaction flask and a connecting tube and a collection beaker and all of these small or even a distillation tube. And you scale that up to the size of the Egyptian pyramids. It's very reminiscent to what we see inside of these structures with reaction chambers, connecting tubes, collection flasks. And I have, again, tons of diagrams in this little presentation that we can get to here in just a second. So my, after my first journey inside the Red Pyramid, my mind was firing. I was coming up with these small details that were pointing me in the direction of industrial scale chemical production. And I knew that ammonia was and still is probably the most important chemical that we've ever discovered and produced on an industrial scale. It was literally the beginning of our modern industrial revolution and ammonia and sulfuric acid are still today the two most important chemicals that we produce on an industrial scale. We wouldn't have anything in our modern world if we didn't have industrial scale fertilizers and sulfuric acid for metallurgy and a variety of other applications. I see you had a question, Anastasia, go ahead. How did you come to chemistry as the metaphor? Like, I think that in general, everybody tends to look in the world at the world and they're informed by some kind of experience that they have when they build models. Like you look at somebody who is a physicist and they model everything as physics. You see somebody who's a biologist, they model everything as biology. And as you get more specific into their disciplines, yeah. they tend to model along the lines of the rules that they learned. And so your background wasn't in chemistry. Were you like a backyard chemist that had like <laughs> play like you yeah, know? How play did you where did you even get the smell of ammonia? Like I think that's something most people wouldn't even necessarily characterize, right? They're just just like, ah, oh, it smells like cleaning products or something. But yeah, yeah where, how'd you so, get into So it? looking back on it now, I've always had a passion for chemistry. And it was something that, you know, if I had known better and gone back and pursued an academic career in chemical engineering, I would probably be making a small fortune as a chemical engineer and not have taken the easy road, which I did, was just to party my way through college and come up with a psychology degree because I was very good at understanding psychology. And one of the reasons I got, well, the, most people get into psychology so you can better understand your own psychosis, right? <laughs> Which is 100%. why I got into it yeah. in the first place. And I, you know, I also, I traveled abroad and I lived in Spain and I ended up having a, a minor in Spanish as well. But I knew that, you know, again, going inside of the red pyramid, I knew that the stains inside were chemical stains. And how I was did very you know, familiar how did, with what How did you is. know that though? Because like I mean, oh, like so I'd go, weird. I'd go inside a room and I'd look at the stains and I'd be like, maybe they're water stains, maybe they're you know, maybe they're yeah. biofilms, maybe like right. My mind would immediately go to biology because that's my frame of reference. And so when you go and you yeah. look and you're like, that's a chemical stain. How do you? How did you know that it was a chemical stain? So the conventional explanation is that the extrusions, because it looks like drips coming out of the stone itself. And the conventional explanation is that this is from the bats inside of the structure that have somehow caused this staining all over the walls of the chamber and that the smell of ammonia is also from bats. But I knew that that was not the case. Immediately as I was like, this is, this is bat shit uh, in that, that terms of that explanation because the way that bats urinate and defecate, they do that when they're flying. So everything would just fall directly to the floor. It's not going to be coming out of the walls, which is exactly what this staining is. There's a flow pattern that is indicative of fluid dynamics, where the staining pattern moves from the upper vaults of these chambers and it moves through the connecting passage. So there's very specific staining patterns inside of these structures. And again, I was, I was always kind of a nerd. I mean, Chemistry, looking back on it, chemistry and physics were always a passion of mine, but I just never pursued it. And it was something that I was always very good at. I remember back in high school, I had a great chemistry teacher and a great physics teacher. And I always loved this stuff. But then again, I kind of went on a different path during college and I had other interests in college as other most people do as well. Um, so again, it's, yeah, it's too bad people. Things. It's too bad. It's just not normal for people to just take a few years off and try out some stuff before they commit to oh, yeah. studying something for four years. It's so wild. If I, if I had only known, right? 
I was so. But again, it was one of those things that by studying the Egyptian pyramids, I really discovered what my passion was, which was chemistry. And like you said, you know, it's like cooking. It's a it's a discipline that you can learn very very easily because it's a step by step process. And by trying to reverse engineer these structures myself, I basically had to teach myself chemistry and chemical engineering so that I could better understand these things. And of course, it puts me down a rabbit hole of all of this research where I had to learn all these things first before I could then try to apply them to the existing engineering inside of these structures. So I had to understand a little bit about chemical engineering so that I could apply that to what I was seeing inside of these structures. And I will say that, you know, basically what I've proposed in my hypotheses is very, very simple chemistry. It's, it's what you would learn in a chemistry 101 or physics 101 pretty rudimentary class in college or even in, you know, later in high school, you learn these type of things. So I'm not talking about really, really sophisticated chemistry, but there are some very unique details about these structures that, again, kind of pointed me in the right direction at looking at physics. And so to it get seems like to they're the also really, really, really well characterized. They're really, really well characterized physical processes too, right? Like the Haber-Bosch process or something that's just been studied, you know, to the wildest depths imaginable because it's directly applicable to our own technological success and our own survival right, as a species, right? right? So Yeah, you, so again, the, yeah, go ahead. So, like, it's a process that's well characterized. You have an interest in chemistry. You put it all together. But you will also, before this, it sounded like we're kind of pursuing a lot of the, like, ancient electricity narratives that people because there's a ton of sure. stuff on like these are old power plants like you look and the there's there's diagrams and people make all of these uh make all of these presentations but we were just talking this morning where it's like none of those feel particularly convincing and right. i wonder if you had the same experience where when you showed up you looked and you were like okay i don't think that those narratives are right I don't think that the narrative that the tour guide is giving is right. What is actually like? What is actually happening here? Is that is that kind of the the process for you? Oh, absolutely! And it was it was literally the the collection bowl at Abu Sir, which chemicals can be collected as an aqueous solution or as a fluid. So as soon as I saw that collection bowl, the light literally went off into my head, and I completely change directions from looking at it from a perspective of ancient chemistry because there was nothing or an ancient electricity. There was nothing that I was seeing inside of these structures that was indicative of electricity production. Mm. And in my opinion, that's one of the greatest deficiencies about the alternative theories about the great pyramid is that they focused exclusively on the great pyramid as if it were the only functional pyramid in all of Egypt. And they don't even address that the other ones even exist let alone try to describe the function of all of these structures. So I think it's important that if you're going to propose a hypothesis for the function of the Egyptian pyramids, it has to be able to address all of the pyramids. Mm, like and this that. is even the way we do things today with our modern chemical engineering. It's done as a series and a sequence where the production of one chemical leads to the production of the next chemical where it's transformed into another chemical. And that's exactly what I started to discover when I began pulling the thread of investigating the potential function of each one of these structures. And for me, it all started with the Red Pyramid by attempting to reverse engineer the structure. So we were just talking this morning too. It seems like a lot of the alternative archaeology suffers potentially from wanting to imagine an ancient technological civilization that is like our ancient, or sorry, like our modern technological civilization, right? right? Like it's it really strains the imagination even more to imagine an advanced technological civilization that didn't use the same kind of technology as us necessarily, right? The same like iPhones or whatever, the same electronic right, right. basis for their civilization. And for me, it's, it's much more exciting to imagine a really advanced civilization that looked nothing like us, right? That would basically yeah. be completely foreign like visiting a new country you'd never heard of, right? With completely different landscape and priorities, and but still being very advanced and very technologically efficient. And chemistry seems to play right into that. It's, it's kind of this right. overlooked gem, right? It's at the foundation of so much of what happens, but we seem to fixate on the, you know, the electronic side, right? The, the interface, the output at the end of the day. 
Yeah. So this is one of the reasons I try to steer myself away from the, I call it a clickbait buzzword of lost ancient high technology. Because for me, high technology is this. If it doesn't have a computer chip in it, to me, high technology is a new word that's described to this modern technology. So we're certainly looking at ancient technology, but alchemy has been the predominant science of all of the ancient civilizations on the planet since the dawn of time. And we wouldn't have any, again, like chemistry even today is the basis of the existence of our modern society. So I think it was one of the original sciences that was being studied by these ancient civilizations. And there was a reason for them to build these massive infrastructure projects because chemicals are such a valuable product for the civilization at large. It can literally terraform the land, be able to produce crops on an industrial scale, metallurgy and all of these other things that they were doing. You know, you can't do these things without chemicals. And so for me, it was kind of a, like a no brainer that as soon as I started to understand that these things were chemistry, I was like, oh, okay, this, this makes sense. And it's compatible with an ancient civilization that had a tremendous amount of knowledge that had been accumulated over a very, very long time. And they were implementing this knowledge of basic physics and basic chemistry on a large scale to benefit the civilization at large. So again, it's something that just, it really spoke to me and resonated to me as being directly related to what I picture this ancient civilization being. So I, I don't want to get off track of the original question because I keep going, branching off. So after my 2022 or my 2020 research expedition, um, my dad passed away. Mm. And that was really um, kind of a life-changing moment for me. And I realized at that time that, you know, our time here on this planet is so short and we only get one opportunity to do this. So I decided at that time that this was going to be my life's work and I was going to put absolutely everything that I had into doing this, whatever it took, whatever I had to do, I was going to turn this into my life's work. And that's one of the reasons that I work with chemical engineers before I ever published anything and put things out publicly, because I wanted to make sure that if this is going to be my testimony and the thing that lives on after I am dead one day, I want it to be something good and something that means something and something that speaks to people on a higher level. And I want it to contain some truth. And even if I get just one small aspect of this, right, it will be a tremendous victory. And that's again, an awesome, testament. that's an awesome way to look at science in general. I wish that all scientists were capable of looking at their work that way and, and being like, well, you know, maybe most of it's wrong, but I hope that the one, I hope that some piece of this is valuable in, in the greater context. Yeah. And I think that it's really valuable too, that there is a plurality of, of explanations that people are driving at. And I think that yeah. the, the health, again, biologist, I think a healthy ecosystem is a diverse ecosystem. And in the sciences, you often have the predominance of a single theory and everybody's just like, no, 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 this is the theory. This is correct. This is the end of science. This is the end of us seeking. And I'm like, you go and you look, I mean, I've never been to Egypt, but when you look at the photographs of the ruins, there's something that happens deep inside your spirit where you just, it almost defies comprehension. In the sense yeah. that, how is it that some some civilization that was so advanced that could build these temples and build these monuments and make this art, that it is now dust? Like it seems, it, it just, it seems like it's so important to be able to unravel what they actually were like in order to learn some kind of lesson from it. Because it feels like if we can't, yeah. then we're just going to, then that's us. Do you know what I mean? Like that's all that effort, all that work, all that time, all those lives spent yeah, that's building us this. Through, that's us 5,000 years from now or something, right? Yeah, if, if yeah, we're not, yeah. If we don't learn something yeah. from this, right? And so that's why I think that this work is so important because without it, we we lose the, if, we, if we're just like, yeah, they're just drainage ditches. I don't know. It's like, is that really the best we can do? Yeah. And so, so for me, I don't like to say I came up with any of these ideas. These, these structures spoke to me and I just happened to have my, my eyes wide enough and my, my mind open enough to try to better understand these things by not 
putting my own narrative into the structures, but letting these structures tell their own story. And that's how I started to better understand these things. And so, for example, when looking at the Red Pyramid of Dashur, there is a converging tiered vault toward the top of these reaction chambers, of course. Yeah, and I can I can jump into a little bit of this presentation here. If I have a screen share ability. Yeah, you do. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And so I knew, even in the very beginning, that Egypt is the birthplace of chemistry. And even according to conventional archaeology and conventional history, Egypt is where the first chemicals were ever being produced. Um, a particular chemical called calcium copper silicate, Egyptian blue, which is what they would conventionally describe as being a paint. And you see this blue color painted all over the monuments in the stars and paintings of God and the gods, and they find this all over the Mediterranean. However, so, so here's, here's one concept to keep in mind. The an original archaeologists that were investigating the Egyptian pyramids, this was done prior to our modern industrial revolution. Mm. So chemical engineering factories did not even exist as a concept at that time. What, so what year? Have, what year? Are we ability. like what time period are we talking about? I don't know. I like yeah, so I like, my like, my like, knowledge of like the arc of Egyptian archaeology is very vague. I'm like 1850s. Like what year? Yeah, so it's it's the late late 1800s, early 1900s okay. is when the science of Egyptology was beginning. And again, these guys that were coming to Egypt and developing this science of Egyptology, these guys weren't engineers. They weren't chemists. They were at best historians and treasure hunters that were looking for adventure and excitement and looking to make a name for themselves by striking it big and making a big discovery here in Egypt. So, so there, there have should have been a fair way. amount of industrial production in, in the late 1800s, I would imagine. When, when was the modern synthetic fertilizer developed? That was, was in World War One. That was World War One. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, the, yeah, I think yeah, that so the like, large so scale like 19, industrial... 1910, 1920 is when, when the modern industrial revolution began. So it, it was right around this time frame. But again, that, that concept wasn't so widespread where they would be able to go and look at these pyramids and say, oh, this is a huge chemical engineering factory. Because again, that, that concept wouldn't have been ingrained enough in their mind. Well, they also, they also had a narrative where they were just going to find primitive people. Exactly. Right. And, and so they go and they're expecting to investigate tombs. So that's the only way that they would have ever been able to conceive these things is as burials. And Well, they did find know, there's, bodies, there's a, right? So they, there, there are, again, I don't want to promote the narrative that there have never been bodies found inside the Egyptian pyramids. Because Is that a narrative? Step, uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of people that say that there's no burials that have that's ever been found inside of a pyramid. And that's, that's not 100% correct. So there have been no burials found in any of the large pyramids. So the Red Pyramid, the Bent Pyramid, the Great Pyramid, or the Central Pyramid. They've never found any bodies inside of these things. Really? Maybe However, somebody just jacked him or something, though. Maybe. And that's, 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 maybe. Sir, maybe. Yeah, yeah, of course. And that's, that's the conventional <laughs> narrative is that, you know, ancient tomb raiders have gone and taken the bodies out of these things. But to give you an example, the Pyramid of Menkara, the third pyramid on the Giza Plateau, the body that they found in there was an intrusive burial of a young woman. Intrusive burial means? So it, it, it was not the, the Pharaoh Menkara. It was a woman, and then they put it into a later burial chamber. But yet they still call this the, the Pyramid of Menkara. The same thing goes with the Step Pyramid of Djoser. No burial was ever found inside of the primary burial chamber. It's, it was it, empty. However, there were what appear to be in what they call intrusive burials, where other shafts have been dug, and there were bodies found inside of these adjacent shafts that were not necessarily part of the original construction. So there's this narrative of intrusive burials that pops up all over Egypt, 
And so if you're looking into a structure and you're finding some bodies and there may not be a body in the main chamber, but there's bodies over here. So I don't want to promote that narrative that no bodies have ever been found because that's, that's not correct, but it's, it's, it's more probable because I don't necessarily believe that the Egyptian pyramids were built during the time frame that we've been given. And even according to the native Egyptians, the timeline of their civilization goes back much further than what is conventionally promoted. They, they use a tablet called the Narmer or Minis palette, and it speaks of the reunification of upper and lower Egypt, where these two civilizations were reunified. And that marks the beginning of the dynastic period around 3500 BC. However, if you are reunifying a civilization, that literally implies that there was a pre-existing time where it was unified at one point, it split up, and then it came back together. So there are thousands of years of Egyptian history that are not accounted for. And my work has pointed me to a time period called the Saharan Wet Period, mm. which is from 8500 BC to 5300 BC where there was plentiful rainfall in the Upper Eastern Sahara. And the Upper Eastern Sahara was actually being transformed into arable farmland. Do you know and the work of Robert Shoke? Into, so what was that? I said, do you know the work of Robert Shoke? Yeah, yeah, Robert Robert Shock, absolutely, yes. Yeah, because he, uh, we've, we've been trying to get him on the podcast for a long time, but he's the, he's the guy who... Uh, studies weathering on the Sphinx and is basically like, I'm Correct. reasonably certain that the Sphinx must have been built during the wet period because it has rain type weathering on it. Yep. So now we'll, we'll get into this in a little bit. And I've also proposed on my channel that, that could also be from acidic rain. And that weathering that happened around the Sphinx enclosure could have actually happened in a very short time period because there were cataclysms around 5300 BC. There was an impact in the Indian Ocean that would have caused massive flooding. And if you imagine that these structures were producing acidic solutions, which is my hypothesis about the Great Pyramid and the Central Pyramid, is that they were producing dilute solutions of sulfuric and hydrochloric acids, respectively. If there was a cataclysm and somehow some of the internal mechanisms and shafts broke, and you have a flood of acidic water on the plateau all of those rainwater drainage you know that what appears to be thousands and thousands of years of rainwater drainage could have happened very very quickly if there was acidic water pouring all over the Giza plateau which this goes back into another thing that i'm currently investigating are the iron oxide deposits that are located all over the Giza plateau and they are adjacent to both the Central Pyramid and the Great Pyramid of Giza. And we have chemical analysis of all of the metals that are in these deposits. And they were using these acidic solutions being produced in the Great and Central Pyramids to leach mine the metals out of these natural deposits on the Giza Plateau. So there's natural deposits of iron, there's gold, there's silver, there's all sorts of very useful metals in these deposits. And it's called leach mining, where you use acidic solutions. You pour it onto a heap. The acidic solutions extract all of the metals, which can then be collected and distilled. And you can retrieve all sorts of various independent metals. So this was a civilization that not only understood chemistry, but also sophisticated metallurgy. We can, we can dive into this presentation a little bit further. So the original yep. name for Egypt is the land of Kem, K-H-E-M. And this is where we get our modern words for alchemy and chemistry. Mm. Alchemy means from the blackness. And we'll talk about this blackness a little bit later on. But it, literally our modern word for alchemy and chemistry comes directly from the name of Egypt, the land of K-H-E-M. And so the title of my book is a play on words. Instead of K-H-E-M, it's the land of C-H-E-M because it's the land of chemistry. And again, they were producing compounds like calcium copper silicate, which is a very, very sophisticated molecule. And they've done investigations using modern science to try to replicate the manufacturing process that would have produced this chemical. 
And it's very, very difficult to do this properly. You have to have very specific heat, very specific pressure. And the consistency of this copper-based paint across the Mediterranean and ancient world is so consistent that it is indicative of a large-scale manufacturing process. Mm. So even to make enough of this blue paint, to paint it all over the monuments, all across the Mediterranean Ocean, not only just in Egypt, but all across the Mediterranean, you have to be producing thousands and thousands of pounds of this stuff and turning it into paint. And so even just paint manufacturing was a huge industrial scale industry where they were producing this sophisticated chemical on an industrial scale to be able to supply all of the painters in Egypt. So this is a narrative that exists within conventional archaeology that is completely absent from the normal discussions, unless you're really into niche ancient Egyptian archaeology, which there are papers that discuss this kind of thing. It's just not something that's readily known about. So, however, the Berkeley Laboratory of Energy and the Royal Society of Chemistry have both started investigating the properties of Egyptian blue. And they've found out that it was a fluorescent pigment that can emit up to 100 times as many photons as it absorbs. Mm -hmm. And now calcium copper silicate is being used for a potential application in medicines for cancer treatments where they ingest or inject calcium copper silicate into certain areas, bombard it with photons. The calcium copper silicate then radiates more energy than it's receiving, which can be used as a very sophisticated medicine. So our modern science is now starting to reveal some of the true properties of this very sophisticated ancient chemical. So this is just sort of a preface to everything that I've put out, that there was absolutely large-scale chemical manufacturing going on in Egypt. And this is an image of the sophisticated lattice structure of calcium copper silicate. And this is, you know, again, the, the conventional story is that they may have discovered this accidentally. And they didn't really understand what they were doing. And, you know, they got some sand and they got some copper and they cooked it up and they somehow were able to make this blue pigment. That could not be further from the truth when you look at the consistency and quality of the final product that was being produced. And it's still today, it is still as pure, again, the, the durability of the molecule. So they've tested samples that are now 5,000 years old, and it's still the same quality as it would have been when they originally manufactured this stuff. I mean, chemistry and especially crystal structures have a tendency of persisting for a long time, right? Like yeah. if you if you were to look into like the, the crystal structure of quartz or something, you'd probably find yeah. a relatively similar structure. And so the complexity of the structure, I think, is inherent to the molecule. But I think that what you're saying about Absolutely. the purity of it is really yeah. vital because purity isn't something that happens accidentally. Like this is, Correct. you know, you, you, whenever you buy, whenever you buy chemicals in a laboratory, there's always different grades of purity and they come associated with price, right? The, ch the least pure version of a chemical is always the cheapest one because yes. the process of getting it to the point of purity is so intensive and difficult. And so I think that that's, that's really interesting that like, how can you have some primitive society that is manufacturing large quantities of a pure chemical that is then being applied in the society for various purposes. It's like it yeah. it it speaks of industrial production, not of accidental like, oh, look at what we made. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I also wanted Absolutely. to just I, I just couldn't like move past this because I'd never heard of an atom that could emit more photons than it absorbed. And I don't think that atoms can emit more photons than they absorb, but they could be higher uh they could be shifted into some spectrum that was more visible and so more powerful in so, some vis visual range. I don't know the details of that or need to be, need you, to be uh, dug you've, into a bit more. You've you've struck on one of Shiloh's favorite topics, which is which is atomic chemistry. Yeah, I'm sorry, I just couldn't I couldn't go past <laughs> that because if if that were true, it would change my 
understanding of the atom a bit. <laughs> and so I'm always like, like so, so remember, so we're not we're not necessarily talking about the atom, but the molecule. Well, presumably yeah, molecules are made out of atoms. So Yeah, I mean, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And again, this isn't this isn't something that I came up with. This is from a legitimate paper from the Berkeley Laboratory of Energy. This is this is just something that I kind of stumbled across in my research, and I'd be happy to forward you because it's a fascinating paper. And yeah, I yeah. can go back. So let me let me read you here what it says specifically. So they were they were developing a coating compound to cover surfaces with Egyptian blue. So measuring the temperature of surfaces coated in Egyptian blue and related compounds when they are exposed to sunlight, Berkeley lab researchers found the fluorescent blue can emit nearly 100% as many photons as they absorb. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. 100% makes sense. Yeah, 100% means that, because like the, the way it works is an atom absorbs a photon and then emits a photon. Like the, it's a transactional thing, right? So I, I mean, it could be like perfectly efficient. That that idealization makes sense. Yeah, because normally what happens when you irradiate an atom is that it absorbs some portion of the energy and gives off less. Mm -hmm. And so finding yes. a substance that absorbs and then emits as much as it absorbs is really rare. So yeah, I think I heard, I don't know if you, you, you misspoke or if I misunderstood, but I thought I heard a hundred times as many photons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This sounds but like it's like one to hundred percent, which yeah. is wild. Yeah. So, so let me let me read further here. So they confirmed that the pigment's fluorescence can be ten times stronger than previously thought. Mm. And the the final quote of the abstract here is: the energy efficiency of the emission process is up to seventy percent. Nice. So I, so I didn't want to just go into reading this entire article. I was trying to just give the, the, the overview yeah, of, of it. Um, but essentially, it's a, it's a fluorescent pigment. You know, I, I, and I give the, the idea of those glow-in-the-dark stars that you used to have on your ceiling as a kid. And there are some pyramids that have this Egyptian blue painted on the ceiling in star patterns. So even just this concept that they were making a fluorescent pigment that was able to emit photons and basically glow in the dark is a, is a pretty fascinating phenomenon that is indicative of the very sophisticated, not only knowledge, but also again of the manufacturing process. So I don't know if I misspoke or either way, but I just good, thank you for clarifying that because again, this is, this isn't something that I've come up with in my research. It's just something I kind of stumbled across um, when I was looking into a few things. I mean, it's super, it's super fascinating. I, I think the main, the main point is that it was very, it was a bright surface, right? That was incredibly sophisticated. And I just knew that we have a lot of nerdy people in our audience and I'm pretty nerdy too. I knew somebody was going to yeah. jump on that if I, if I didn't make sense of it. I'm sorry to interrupt though. Oh, no, no, not at all. Again, I, I prefer, again, this, it is super important to me that anything that I've put out there is, is scientifically verifiable. So again, I don't want to miss speak when I when I read any of this stuff. I just didn't want to get caught into to reading this stuff off the page. Um, yeah, this is another publication from the Royal Society of Chemistry. And the Royal Society of Chemistry is a very interesting group that has a lineage of people going back to ancient alchemists and now has become our modern society for studying and investigating chemistry. So they were reporting on Egyptian blue being used as an anode material for lithium ion batteries. And they so recent studies on Egyptian blue have yielded newly discovered properties such as near infrared photoluminescence. And even more recently, the discovery of exfoliating Egyptian blue into nano sheets has breathed new life into studies as it being a functional nano material. So this is just an indication that we can now take our modern science and investigate these ancient materials to really discover their true potential. And there were some samples taken from an exterior coating compound on the casing stones of the red pyramid that it could be a chemically resistant self repairing coating compound. And I'll get to this a little bit further. And this was another investigation by the Royal Society of Chemistry. That lines up directly with some chemical analyses that were taken from some, some of these structures. So here, this is the artifact that changed everything for me, mm. which is the red quartzite conduit 
and Collection Bowl at Abu Sir. And I discovered that I didn't discover it. It's, it's pretty well known about, but I, I stumbled across this during my 2017 research expedition. And again, I'm kind of hearing my guide say, oh, the conventional story is this is drainage water coming from off the pyramid and they collect it into this bowl. And I was like, that does not make any sense whatsoever. Because It's you, such a small all, bowl you know, for drainage off of a pyramid. Like if you, if it's a drainage, yeah, so you would expect to, to like, to drain, but how much water can you possibly collect off of, uh, like you're exactly. going to get way more they, water than would fit in that bowl. Yeah. So they're draining the water into the bowl. And then people go with cups and scoop all the water out to keep the drainage <laughs> thing, the, the collection. Like, it doesn't make any sense. And you certainly don't go through all of the extra effort of bringing in rare exotic stone from hundreds and hundreds of miles away and carving it into this exquisite collection bowl. It was intended to collect something. Mm. And so, of course, my mind is, um, you know, someone who's familiar with ceremonial magic and you know, these sorts of practices as well. So again, my next thought was, okay, so it was the chemicals used in the embalming rituals and some of the, the rituals being performed in the temple for the burial. But as someone who's familiar with these practices, if you're making a ritualistic chemical, you do not reuse it. Once it is done, it is discarded. You're not collecting a used chemical that was used in a ritual and collecting it and then you're going to reuse it again. That's, that's not how ceremonial magic works. Something is intended for a specific purpose. It is used once and then it is discarded. So they certainly wouldn't have been collecting embalming fluids or anything like that that have then run through this conduit, you know, been passed through bodies and then you collect it. What are you going to do with it after that? So again, that really didn't make sense to me. And at the time in 2017, I had not discovered the inlet to this conduit system, but I knew even then in 2017 that the inlet would be connected to the base of the pyramid. And fast forward, I believe this was my 20 and I get my, my research trips mixed up. I think this was my 2021 or 2022 research expedition. And we happened to come around the back side of the pyramid of Nyusere. And normally you go in through the front or you come from Abu Ghraib where you come in from the north. But we happen to go around the backside and we were coming in on the southwest around to the southeastern corner. And I saw this red granite lentil, this little beam, horizontal beam going across the top, poking out of the sand. And I knew, I was like, oh, that's red quartzite. And I knew that this was the inlet to the conduit system that goes about 100 or 200 meters underground, under the temple, into that collection bowl. And it was exactly where I thought it would be. If you turn around in this picture, you're literally facing the base of the eastern side of the pyramid. And I was just on site at the pyramid of Yusurkov in Saqqara, walking around the exterior of the pyramid, and I stumbled across another artifact that is exactly like this, carved from black granite, connected into the eastern side of the pyramid. And this is, and this so one, is, so hold on, of, hold on one second. I, I have like, I have a hard visual yep. time. So the, the collection bowl that you showed relative to this inlet, where is it in this yes. photograph? So if you follow that inlet straight, so okay. we're looking eastward toward where the Nile River used to be. So mm. the Nile River used to come literally up to the threshold of the temples. Mm -hmm. And there were harbor areas at each one of these temples. So there was a harbor in Saqqara, there was a harbor in Dashur, and there was a harbor in Giza where the water would literally come up to the temple. You could dock your boat in the harbor and go directly into the temple. Mm. which to me is an indication of the distribution process of this chemical manufacturing facilities. Because today you have your chemical manufacturing plant, you have a little warehouse, and then you have distribution where the trucks and stuff arrive, they collect the materials, and then they take them elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And I believe that was exactly what was happening in this ancient chemical manufacturing area is they were manufacturing the chemicals, that were moved into a processing site for further, um, you know, whatever they might be doing with the finishing of the raw materials, packaging them up, 
And then they were put onto boats and distributed across the Mediterranean and across the world. And so the the collection bowl is directly straight ahead in this photograph. The former location Correct. of the Nile is farther away, but close to where the collection bowl is. And where is this black yeah. granite lintel relative to the photograph? Yeah, so is it a part of the same temple? Site. It's at a totally completely different, different site. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. So it's it's the it's the pyramid of Yusurkov, which is in Saqqara. So these three pyramids, uh, again, I'm going to forget at least one of them. So it's the pyramid of Nayusare, the pyramid of Sahura, and I always forget the third one, but it's right next to another temple, the temple of Ptahhotep, where there is another very unusual artifact that appears to be like a capacitor because it has layers of red granite. The exterior is red granite. The interior is limestone. And they're staining all over the inside of the limestone, which goes into another very interesting tangent of what could have been the, the final internal layer inside of this container. Hmm. Um, but nonetheless, there are these conduits and collection-related artifacts at all of these sites. And they would, again, say that this is for drainage water, draining it off, and you carve something out of black granite, and you collect it into a fancy collection bowl. And uh, again, that just... As soon as I saw it, I knew what I was looking at. Mm. <clears throat> so then we go inside the red pyramid of Dashur. And these are some old pictures here on the left. This is during the modern restoration process where you can literally see the fluid dynamic patterns here in the lower portion of the chamber. So in the lower part of the chamber, you're looking at the southeastern corner here. And there appears to be a wave pattern crashing into this southeastern corner. And then it flows around the lower portion of the chamber into the northwestern corner. And we've actually done a series of demonstrations where we got a tub that is the same dimensions of the lower part of the chamber. And we put the inlet shaft where we think the inlet shaft was and pumped water into this container and it produces that exact same wave pattern in the lower portion of the chamber. Mm. And then if you look into the upper portion of the chamber, the staining gets incredibly dark and nebulous. It gets darker and darker and darker the further you get into the upper portion of the chamber. And you can see it's moving from the upper portion of the chamber down in through this connecting shaft. And there's a flow pattern that moves from the upper vault through the connecting shaft into the secondary chamber. And you can still see this stuff today, but these pictures are before they installed the modern wooden floor. And they've also gone in here and cleaned these structures. Aww. And all of these structures have been renovated and cleaned and, you know, sanitized for the public where they've removed as many indications of the original function as possible. So again, that's that's going to make quite a story there, someday in the in the archaeological textbooks of yeah. what not to do. Oh, and I I have some some new chemical analyses that are coming up on the channel over the next two weeks that are really going to blow the lid off of what was really found inside of these structures and what it was capable of doing. So again, you were asking me how did how did I know that this was chemistry? I I immediately knew that I was looking at flow patterns. So again, what I, I, what do you what do you make of the, okay so you have this connecting chamber right so there's there's a yeah. door that's at the bottom bottom right of the left picture and so yeah. if you were pouring water into this if you were pouring liquid into this space you would expect that the liquid would run through that conduit and so how do you have it the does. secondary so how do you have the secondary flow that's coming from the top? You think that it's like some kind of like distillation column where it accumulated there and then would like leak through into the into the conduit? Ah, uh, very good question. So the first step in the process is filling the lower portion of the chamber so that that connecting shaft is filled with water. And what this does is it isolates the remaining space in each reaction chamber because there's no air that's going to move through there if that connecting shaft is filled with water. This also sets the initial pressure conditions inside of the chamber. Mm. So now we're going to go back to physics 101. If you take a gas 
that is in a square container, for example, and you cut the volume in half, what have you done? You've increased the pressure and increased temperature because those molecules are going to be colliding even more. They're under much higher pressure. So if you take a water insoluble gas, you can use water as a plunger mechanism to force that water insoluble gas into the upper portions of the chamber. And this chamber is designed with progressively reduced volume. So the further you push the gas up into the chamber, the higher the temperature gets and the higher the pressure becomes. And there are many, many other mechanisms of operation that are involved in increasing the temperature and pressure. And I'm also going to show evidence of a catalytic coating and sealing compound that was discovered. Again, I knew that this staining was not from bats. I knew that it was chemicals. And fast forward six years, we now have samples that were taken of the staining material, and it's filled with the exact same metals that we use today as the catalyst in the Haber process, specifically iron oxide and aluminum oxide, which is coating these chambers. And then this is the, the secondary chamber here. So this one on the left is the primary reaction chamber. The one on the right is the secondary chamber. And this is before, because now there's a modern staircase that's built right here that covers this entire wall up. Hmm. And there's no way that you can tell me that this staining is from bats. And I knew as soon as I started hearing the conventional, you know, because again, the, the keepers of the sites are the ones that tell you, oh, it's from the bats. Pay no attention to the chemical stains or the smell of ammonia. It's from the bats. And I have been in plenty of other structures specifically Mastaba 17 at the Pyramid of My Doom, which is a very small underground chamber that's filled with bats. And I went down in there to film a video specifically to show that there is zero staining on the walls. There's a bunch of bat poop on the floor, but there is no staining on the walls, and it does not smell like ammonia in there. Mm. And there's almost zero airflow. You have to go through this underground tunnel, crawl on your hands and knees through a tunnel that's maybe two feet by two feet, to get inside of this thing and it's filled with bats and there's no, there's no staining on the walls and no, no smell of ammonia. Mm. So we've yeah, got bat poop kind of smells like gunpowder or something. It's a, mm. it's a very particular smell, right? So it does. It's, it's guano, you know, and, and again, if, if this was something organic like urine or, or feces of some sort, it would have a very organic decomposition smell because it's been in there forever. This smells like pure ammonia. Like if you were to take a, a jug of ammonia from underneath your sink, open it up and take a whiff of it, Don't it, do will, that. it will make you dizzy. It, I've spent, <laughs> Smelling I've salts. Spent, oh yeah, no, exactly. You know, ammonia, ammonium, um, ammonium chloride or whatever they use for smelling. So I'm pretty sure it's ammonium chloride. Um, it'll, 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 it'll get your brain fired up real quick. Mm. And I've spent so much time inside of that final chamber that I've had trouble getting down the stairs because I get so like, you, it'll, <laughs> it'll get your head spin if you spend enough time in there, um, which I've spent hours inside of this structure looking at this staining and trying to understand what was better going on inside of the structure. And again, so I, I get this, I see the chemical staining, I can smell the ammonia, I can see the flow patterns. And then maybe I it's a, looking. Maybe it's a good idea to just orient us to the Haber-Bosch process or you know, just give an overview of how this works so that we can map it onto the structure better. Boom. Ask and you shall receive, sir. <laughs> so this here on the left is the first apparatus that was designed by Fritz Haber to manufacture ammonia. And I did some investigation into the life of old Fritz Haber, and it turns out that he was a big fan of Egypt. and He used to come here on his, his vacations with his wife, he spent a ton of time in Egypt. And of course, these guys had access into these pyramids. So I would propose that old Fritz Haber had the exact same experience that I did inside of the Red Pyramid. He goes inside there, he sees the chemical staining. He was a chemist. He was a chemical engineer. He was the first person that went inside of these structures with our modern knowledge of manufacturing chemicals. And if you look at the configuration of this apparatus, yeah, can you just yeah. describe it for people? What's going on yeah, there? Yeah, so these are these are metal, three metal chambers. 
And the first two chambers are the exact same size. And they are at the same level in the apparatus. And there's the a same height. Shaft. Yeah. There's, there's an inlet shaft that goes into the first chamber. The first chamber is connected by a connecting tube into the second chamber. And then the third chamber is larger than the second tube. And he put it on an elevated platform. So it's, it's a little bit higher in the structure or in the apparatus than the other two chambers, which are essentially at quote unquote ground level. And then if you look over here at the right, at the configuration of the red pyramid, it's the exact same configuration where your first and second reaction chamber are the same size. They're both at ground level, connected with a connected tube, and your third and final synthesis chamber is elevated above the other two, and it's significantly larger than the first two. Okay, so why, why that so configuration? I, I believe he did it as an homage to the place from whence it came. He could have designed this apparatus with any sort of permutation of sizes of chambers. But I really do think that this was intended to give credit to the place where it was discovered, which is the Red Pyramid of Dashur. And was there and, a functional necessity? Is this because at each stage you're skimming off the top and you need to be able to collect that pressurized portion and move it to the next easily? So there's a natural stepwise. So, so again, the, the elevation of the third chamber, is, I believe, is completely arbitrary because hmm. you're, again, you're using pressurized chambers and pressurized tubes to push the gas into the final chamber. So there's no reason to put it any higher than the other ones other than simply for, for the um, aesthetic design of the apparatus itself. Cause you could make this stand a little bit shorter and it sits on the same level and it would work the exact same way. It doesn't, it doesn't change the pressure capabilities of the machine itself. Mm. But in the case of the Egyptians, maybe it, it was sort of a, the shortest path, the straightest path would be, it would be more simple to just put it on, on the level of the, upper part of the previous chamber or something like that hey so yeah, i have went, a went to... i have a quick question um yes, there's there's three chambers in this photo that you're showing us yes. or in this drawing that you're showing us and the the pictures that you showed before there you showed just two chambers which Correct. of the chambers on this diagram were we looking at yep so in the first picture and i'll go back one sec we're looking at the southern wall of chamber number one. And the second picture, we're looking at the southern wall of chamber number two. And you'll see this little connecting shaft up here. Let me go back one slide. Yeah, because so I didn't. Here on the left, mm -hmm. this is the southern wall of chamber number one mm -hmm. with the connecting shaft leading into chamber number two. This is the southern wall of chamber number two. And this up here, this mm -hmm. little hole, is the connecting shaft that leads into the third chamber. Mm. And now they have a, a modern scaffold and a staircase here. So you can you go up a staircase into this upper part, and then you walk through this little shaft here into the final chamber. What's the conventional explanation for these shaft things? They're just access points? They have no conventional explanation. And, and when you go to Egypt, and, and you guys are now invited formally to join me, I'm, I have... A few spots left, just enough to accommodate you for my tour later on this year. Um, so off offline, send me an email and I'll, I'll send you the tour itinerary and pricing. But this is another one of the reasons that I came to Egypt is to facilitate the process of people coming here. Because for me, coming to Egypt was such a transformative experience that I wanted to be able to bring people here so that they could experience what I've experienced. And it, it will literally change your life. So this year I'm hosting my first formal tour and I'm only taking 10 people because I do not want to be a shepherd and I want this to be a very intimate experience for people who are really going to appreciate this. I'm not, you know, I'm not out here to make a ton of money on a huge tour group. That's just, that's not why I'm doing this. I do this because I love it. So I worked for, uh, I worked as a, as a mountain guide for a while. And I think that 10 people is, is the like absolute max for one person for it to still oh, yeah. be an experience. So I totally feel you. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I know other tour guides here that I was just with a group that was 25 Chinese tourists. And I know other groups that come with 50 and 60 people and to get in and out, in and out of these pyramids and to have an intimate, just even if I can't count 
you know, with a quick head count and make sure that all of the people are there and accounted for, it's too many people. And 10 people, I can look at the group. I know all of them personally and be like, oh, hey, dude is missing. Where is XYZ person? Because <laughs> I know all 10 of the people. He's like passed out in the ammonia chamber. <laughs> right. Yeah. You never know. So again, I, I just, I'm doing this so that people can have the same experience. And I'm literally taking them through the same research expedition that I had during my first trip to Egypt. And we're going to go see all of these same sites so that I can walk people through the process of my discovery and my better understanding of the pyramids so that they can have that same experience. And it's, it's a very, the people that are coming so far, it's, it's absolutely amazing. So any of your listeners or, or watchers that want to want to come to Egypt, um, send me an email, contact at thelandofchem.com and make sure you put subject line 2023 Egypt tour because I get tons of emails and this is a very easy way for me to keep track of these email chains. So 2023 Egypt tour, I'll send you the formal tour itinerary and pricing. So to get back to your question about the chemical manufacturing process that's involved, if I'm any good, I've got a slide in here somewhere. Yeah. Okay. We'll get to it in just a second. So even the word ammonia, our modern word for ammonia the etymology of this word is directly related to ancient Egypt. So the original word for ammonia was sal ammoniac, which was the alchemical term for ammonia salt. And this literally means the salt of Amon. That should have rang a bell in your head, Amon being one of the deities in the Egyptian pantheon. So it's literally the salt of Amon that became sal ammoniac, which is our modern word for ammonia. And they've discovered at the temple, temple of Jupiter Amon was some of the first production of ammonia from ammonia salts. And, and down here at the bottom, this is coming from basically an explanation of the etymology of the word. The name Amon, whose hieroglyph is featured above, may derive from a word meaning invisible or hidden not unlike the very gas in which his name surprisingly lives on. So within my work, I also go through a reinterpretation of some of the hieroglyphs, symbols, and deities from the dynastic Egyptian civilization and evaluate them as esoteric symbols because this was an esoteric civilization with multiple layers of interpretation depending on your level of initiation. And I truly believe that chemistry, even today, the average Joe can't just go and practice chemistry because it is very dangerous. If you mix mess around and mix the wrong two chemicals, you can be in some serious trouble. So it was always a very protected science that was only intended for initiates into the science of ancient chemistry. Hmm. And this is kind of one of the themes that I've put forward in my book. So my book is written as a fictional narrative, and this is done very intentionally. Um, again, my dad in his infinite wisdom. So again, to kind of go back to the story of the development of the whole, whole thing. So I, I came back from 2017, started developing all my theories on the function of these structures. It took about two years for me to put everything together in small pieces. And I had this huge presentation and I didn't know what I was going to do with this presentation. And I had no idea what I was going to do with the material and God and the universe work in very mysterious ways. And my father was a colonel in the U.S. military and not the type of person I would ever expect to go on a, uh, to see a presentation on the seven principles of hermetic philosophy, basically the Kabbalion. So my stepmother talks my dad into going to this presentation. My dad goes, he's actually really into it. And of course, my dad was the type to walk up to anybody and have a conversation. So he starts talking to the guy that gave the presentation. Turns out he was a brother Rosicrucian and also a PhD chemical engineer and master's level professor who had multiple patents, both U.S. and international in the field of chemical engineering. So I'm also a 32nd degree Freemason and the Rosicrucians are a sister organization to the Freemasons. So my dad got this guy's contact information. He sent it to me, he said, hey, call this guy and talk to him and, and have him verify your work. So Ed and I got in touch. I basically gave him the presentation and he said, I'm going to treat you like a grad student. 
and I'm going to tear this to shreds. And if it has any scientific validity, you're going to have to build it up piece by piece. And that's exactly what he did. So I started from the very beginning, basically a similar presentation to what you're going to see tonight, going through every single detail and making sure that I could check all the T's and dot all the I's and all my nuts and bolts were in order. And at the end of the day, he said that my theory was the most comprehensive and scientifically verifiable theory about the function of the Egyptian pyramids. And he believed in this so much that he let me put his name. Ed Elton is now in the acknowledgments of my book. So I had presented this to my friend Alan from the Sacred Geometry Decoded channel. And he saw this before I ever. And he's somebody who's very familiar with the Egyptian pyramids. And he was the first guy that I'd ever showed this to and after a three or four hour long presentation, he got up and he gave me a standing ovation. And it literally almost brought me to tears because it was the first person that had ever heard the whole theory. And he was so, I was so moved by the response. I really didn't expect that. So the next person I showed it to was Ed. Ed and I are working together. He's like, okay, you got something here. So now it was time for me to show this to my father. And I knew that my, my dad is a no-nonsense, pretty hard-ass dude. And, and if I was full of shit, he was going to call me on it. And so, you know, I'm starting to show him this thing. He's sitting through it very, very patiently, about three or four hours. I'm going through the thing. And he's like, at the end, he was like, all right. He's like, you convinced me. He's like, I think you, I think you got something there. So he says, what are you going to do with it? I said, well, dad, maybe I'm going to write a research paper. And he's like, Shh. he's like, man, you don't you don't have any academic qualifications. Mm. You're not a chemical engineer. You have no connections in conventional academia. If you write a dry ass, boring research paper, nobody is going to read it and it is going to go nowhere. He was like, man, just write a, write the story, write the book. He's like, you are so full of shit. Anyway, he's like, just, just write the story. And you know, of course <laughs> it's coming from my military father and I got this guy. He's like, you're full of shit. He's like, just, just write the story. Cause he knew that I was always, you know, pretty good at writing and telling stories and all this stuff. So I wrote the book as the story of a young man's initiation into an ancient secret society that was responsible for the construction and operation of the Egyptian pyramids. And it's not only a story of my exploration and discovery of Egypt, but it's a story of this young man coming to Egypt from Ireland. And the book culminates in Ireland. And we'll get to that here in just a little bit where I talk about Newgrange, the passage chamber structures of Ireland. So he comes to Egypt to be initiated into the order of Chem, and during each degree, so the first degree, second degree, third degree, he goes through, and there's a monologue written in the book that basically is all of the technical explanation and information, blah, 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 chemical XYZ goes in here, 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 and it's an old man initiating the young man into this esoteric society, which is kind of also a, you know, get up. <laughs> a play on words for my own initiation through the degrees of Freemasonry. So I've incorporated all of these things about my life and my story into this book. And it's a way for me to paint the picture. And there's a great quote by Rudyard Kipling that said, if history were told in the form of stories, then it would never be forgotten. Mm -hmm. And again, my dad, though, um, <clears throat> I almost got choked up there. Um, Sorry, I thought we so lost your audio. My dad in, 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 his, in his infinite wisdom, um, I, was, I was holding back, back, back tears there for a second. Um, mm. Because again, I was, I was so inspired by what my dad said. And he, he knew what he was talking about. He knew that this was the way to deliver the material. And he said, just write the book, tell the story. And so that's what I did. And that's, that's what became the land of chem, an initiation into ancient chemistry through the degrees of the Egyptian pyramids is the, is the full title of the, the book. Um, Man, so I, I think I, I just want to mention, like, we also arrive at a very similar conclusion. We're trying to write our first book right now. And we have some, like, limited credentials in science, but we wanted to write a book about things that are outside of that, right? Because we've, since yep. working in the academy in, you know, professional research, we've been led in all these different directions. And we also essentially arrived at the idea that we need to tell a story and not try to publish papers and not try to like fight that battle because right. that ship is kind of sailed for us. But yep. you're writing for the next generation. You're writing for the person who is you 15, 20 years ago and encounters Absolutely. the ideas 
and yep. then is able to build on them. I think that it's a multi-generational project and mythology really is the place where we store, where we Absolutely. store knowledge. And my, my idea, when I, when I started to conceive of the physical manifestation of the book, so this goes into like the power of manifestation and focusing on your goals and believing on something so strongly and be able, you have to be able to picture it. And as soon as I started writing this book, I started the picture, the physical picture in my mind of getting the actual book. And I knew that one day it would manifest into physical reality. And I could already see it before it existed. And it, it turned out having this gorgeous metallic foil stamping with purple orchid paper on the inside and papyrus. And it was exactly the perfect physical manifestation of my dreams. And I envisioned that one day, some kid in the distant future, way after I'm gone, will find this in a dusty corner of a library and dust the cover off of this book and start reading this like, man, this guy was fucking nuts, but this is some cool shit, <laughs> you know, like he was in it, you know, and I, I, I get that even just like the chills going up on my, my arms and stuff, even thinking about that because me discovering the book, this is something that, again, you ask me what drives me. This is what drives me. And again, as soon as I set my foot in the desert, I knew that this would be my life. And this is, a, this is my testimony of why I was put here on this planet and why I was given a second chance by God to do exactly this, because I should have been dead on the road. I had a proverbial, you know, white light experience speaking to God and then boom, back in your body. Hey, you get one more chance to do this the right way. And it completely changed the path of my life. And everything that has happened since then is such a huge departure from what I was before. So I was literally given a second chance by, by God, the almighty creator. And I don't preach any religion. I'm a student of all religions and a practitioner of none. I just believe in the higher power. And nice. it is because I, I changed my life and tried to become the man that I was always destined to be that I was able to pursue this path. Um, and I want to just say that's, that's, that's like in stark opposition to it. Like we, you know, people are always sending us new theories that we haven't heard of. And, you know, it's, there's, it seems like people fall into one of two camps where a, a lot of people will have an idea and they'll take it to their favorite scientist and they'll get laughed out of the room. And they just develop this real, like, thick skinned attitude, like, well, there's no point in even trying. Like those people know nothing, and they just—it's it, kind of sad because I feel like there's a lot of good ideas that are just orphaned out, you know, in the swamplands as a result of that. Whereas it's obviously a much more effective approach to just go around the barrier somehow and think about, well, what can I do that would get this to people? Maybe not those people, but how can I get this yeah. idea out? So I, I really, I'm inspired by that. It's, it's, it's really cool. And I, I will say, looking back at it, I was absolutely terrified to begin my first conversation with Ed because he was a bit of a hard ass as well. And he's a, he's a retired professor, you know, again, PhD chemical engineer, master's level professor, multiple international patents. And I'm just some fucking guy. I'm just a dude that came up with an idea. What do I know about anything? So I was really afraid that when I started to present this to him, that I would get that conventional um, backlash from the academic community. Like, oh, this is nonsense. You know, there's no way any of this could happen. Nothing that you're talking about is physically possible, blah, blah, blah. But I literally, again, he, he tore it to shreds and said, okay, start from the very beginning. Describe every single aspect of what you were intending to present. And step by step, piece by piece, he started to come around and see like, okay, maybe there may be something to this. Well, I need you to explain a little bit more about this. And how does this operate? What, what type of temperature? You know, all this sort of stuff. And again, very, very slowly, he started to come around and see like, oh, there, there is some validity to this. And um, I did a huge pod. I don't know if you're familiar with Funny Old World, Johanna James, but she has a huge channel. And she happened to stumble across my work. Um, there was another uh, researcher and tour guide that was crossing paths with her. And he kind of mentioned, Hey, check out the land of chem. Um, shout out to Larry Sage silent. Um, the American Institute of pyramid research, uh, the great pyramid on YouTube. Um, he investigates the mathematics in all of these structures. And I like to give credit where credit's due because if it weren't for Larry giving me a shout out to Johanna. So anyway, she invited me to come on her show. That, that interview had 200,000 views in like two weeks. And my channel absolutely exploded. 
And there were a lot of people, because I was watching the live chat as this thing premiered, and there's people at the be, oh, this is nonsense. There's no way. I'm a chemical engineer. And you see the people, as I started to go through the presentation, they're like, oh, okay, well, okay, this makes sense. Mm. And he, okay, now he's on to something here. And by the time I started getting to sono chemistry and acoustic chemistry to create catalytic chemical reaction. So the acoustic properties of these structures, how is it activated and what is it used for? I explain all of that in my hypothesis. And at the end of the day, oh, I'm a, I'm a chemical engineer who's experienced in sono chemistry. And we're currently using sono chemistry to catalyze chemical, you know, all these people, legitimate people in the field started boom, boom, boom. Now, I have emails from physicists and chemical engineers that have reached out. Hey, I love your work. I'm here to support you. Let me know if you have any questions. And I've been working with a, a physicist to try to better understand some things that are just, it's beyond my realm of understanding. So I'm just the guy who came up with an idea. And my eventual goal for this entire project was to get this in the hands of people who know more than me. And there's a great software program called Comsol Multiphysics Modeling. And it's a software program where you can upload 3D models of your components into the software and it will run the parameters that are designed around your component to test heat distribution, pressure, fluid dynamics, acoustic pressure, all of these sort of aspects. However, so I called the guy because this was when I was working for the IT company, we used to sell this software. As soon as I came up with the idea, I was like, oh shit, console be a great way to try to test this theory. So I'm talking to this Indian engineer. He was like, you want to use our software to do what? <laughs> he was like, what? What are you? And he was, he was, his mind was totally I like blown. that he kind of came out Egyptian there. Oh yeah. Cause again, that's, that's like, I'm so versed <laughs> in that culture. I couldn't do the, the Indian accent, right? He's totally Egyptian. Egyptian but, uh, Indian, maybe. He was like, he was like, you want to, you want to use our, he's like, what do you want to do? He's like, you want to test the Egyptian pyramids using comms? Like, yeah. He's like, he's like, dude, this is crazy. He's like, I love it, but this is nuts. He was like, well, you know, our, our software really isn't designed to recreate the pyramids and it's not designed to test the functions of stone because the stone that was utilized in the, the construction of these monuments is a, is a physical part of how it works. Mm -hmm. And we'll get to that here in just a second because um, all of these structures are built on very specific places in the planet. Can and I? Um, of, yes. Can we take a bathroom break? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. All right. Give me a minute. And so now I just want to take you on the ride of how I came up with the rest of this idea. So we, we basically laid the groundwork for how I came up with this idea, how I ended up writing the book. And now the rest of the presentation takes you on the rest of the journey. Um, so you're asking about the Haber process. And this is where I started to move back in time from focusing on the red pyramid to doing a backward investigation to, okay, so we, we have the red pyramid here. This is where I've started my investigation. So where are they getting the initial reactants? So I started looking at the Haber process. And the first step in the process is reacting methane gas with steam from water. So I said, okay, methane gas. That, original, that immediately stuck out in my head because I was very familiar with a process called anaerobic digestion and the process of producing methane gas using biological materials, specifically cattle manure, water, and agricultural scrap materials. And it's a very, very simple process that is still being used today in rural agricultural areas. The ancient Indians were using this exact same process. And it's very simple. You have an inlet shaft into a digester. You pour a slurry of water, cattle manure, and agricultural scrap material into your digestion chamber. The cattle manure contain anaerobic bacteria that begin the digestion process that digests the carbon-based agricultural scrap material and convert it into CH4 or methane gas. Very, very simple process. And as soon as I started looking at the diagrams, so again, I, I, methane gas, okay, how is methane gas produced? I started looking at methane gas production and I saw these diagrams, specifically the one here on the right. And I was like, oh, I know exactly what we're looking at here. 
So here on the right, this is a modern biogas digester. There's a mixing pit, an inlet shaft that goes into a rectangular digestion chamber, and there's an outlet shaft leading out the other side. And as soon as I saw this diagram, I knew that I was looking at the step pyramid of Saqqara, which is the diagram that you see here on the left, which has a very similar original configuration. So there's a number of things to sort of dissect here in regard to the construction process of the step pyramid of Saqqara. It was not originally a pyramid. It was originally a single level mastaba platform that you can see here in yellow that basically encased the top of the digester. And the original components are the northern inlet shaft, the rectangular chamber, and the southern outlet shaft. So it has all of the necessary components to produce this chemical reaction. Now, fast forward ahead into something that's going to be coming up on my YouTube channel very soon. It turns out there's some very interesting geological deposits all across Egypt. We know that there's lots of oil here in the Middle East. And it turns out that there is a modern oil refinery literally right across the street from the Red Pyramid of Dashur. Hmm. And come to find out, an aqueous ammonia solution is currently used in our modern oil refining process. So these pyramids were built near geological deposits of ancient oil. And around these oil deposits, you also have deposits of natural gas, methane, that is embedded in the bedrock from these ancient agricultural carbon-based deposits that are inside of the ground itself. So I believe that the initial construction was this mastaba and a simple biogas digester. And then these excavated tunnels that you see here from the bird's eye view were excavated later to tap into natural gas deposits that were underneath the ground. To expedite, facilitate, and exponentially increase the amount of methane gas that was being produced inside of the structure. So that's the long story short explanation of the Step Pyramid of Saqqara. And then the light bulb started to go off in my head. So we see the deification of cattle in the ancient world, prolifically across the globe. In every single ancient civilization, they deified cattle. Of course, there's the, what I would call not superficial in terms of not having significance, but superficial in terms of being the surface layer, interpretation of the astrological significance of the constellation Taurus. But let's propose that this was an ancient civilization that was predominantly focused on alchemy, chemistry. And they were using the cattle manure to produce a sacred chemical methane gas that could not only provide food, fuel, boiling water, heating your home, lighting. Everyone asked, how did they excavate these things? And there's no soot all over these tunnels. The ancient Chinese were using bamboo pipelines to harvest natural gas deposits. And they had methane lamps that would not produce any soot. Great way to light an underground chamber where you're not suffocating yourself with carbon monoxide and getting soot all over the inside of these chambers. So this is a way to look at the esoteric significance of the deification of cattle is that they were using the cattle manure to produce chemicals. You also have the scarab beetle, which is another prolific symbol in the dynastic Egyptian religion, which is supposed to represent the rising and setting sun, the god Kepri, and the scarab beetle rolling this ball of dung is supposed to somehow represent the glorious rising and setting of the sun. Even as a kid, when I was kind of learning about these symbols, that never made any sense to me. This is basically a desert cockroach pushing around a ball of manure, poo, around the, the desert. How is that supposed to represent the solar cycle? It never made any sense. But if you look at this from the operative perspective of the first step of methane production, what's the first step in the process? You got to collect the dung. And that was exactly the operative behavior of this beetle is to go around and collect dung. So I think there is an esoteric dual interpretation of these symbols, something that was intended for the general public, as, as all great esoteric symbols are. They have dual layers. One is intended for the spiritual religious interpretation that is understood by the public. And there's a deeper interpretation.
that is intended for the initiates of the sacred sciences. And unless you were initiated into the science of chemistry, you would have never understood the dual significance of these symbols. And again, you see that with the god Amon as well. So this is the god of fertility. So what is ammonia? It is a fertilizer. Mm. So Amon was not necessarily the deity of fertility. He was the deity of fertilization because they were using ammonia for fertilizer. So again, it's a, it's a dual layer esoteric symbol that depending on your level of initiation is your level of comprehension of these symbols. And again, this is something that we still use today. These biogas digesters are used in rural areas. So again, this kind of goes back to the discussion of the timeline of construction, where during the Saharan wet period, we see this prolific agricultural farming in the upper eastern Sahara. And we also see in the, agri or the historical record, this is where the beginning of the domestication of cattle begins. So the ancient Egyptians originally lived around the Nile River. As the upper eastern Sahara was experiencing all of this rainfall, their civilization moved away from the Nile River into the areas where were now arable farmlands because there was prolific rainfall. They were able to grow crops in these areas and they started domesticating cattle on a very large scale. So they're not only using the fertilizers from the Red Pyramid and Bent Pyramids of Dashur to help with the fertilization of what used to be a desert to terraform this area with the assistance of the rainfall, but then they were also collecting the manure, shipping it back to the Step Pyramid and making methane gas, which was, it's a huge manufacturing cycle that is kind of running directly in conjunction with a, a large agricultural and industrial civilization, which is exactly what ancient Egypt really would have been. They, we they get this unfortunate perception of the ancient Egyptians as being these you know, loincloth wearing very primitive people. But it was, again, just looking back at calcium copper silicate and just the paint manufacturing industry. And we'll get to that again here in a second, talking about the coating compound that painted the red pyramid. It's a huge amount of paint to manufacture. And it's a, it's a, it's a industry in and of itself was just the paint manufacturing industry. So now looking back here, this is just another depiction of the, the red pyramid of Dashur in the internal reaction chambers. And it appears that the inlet for the water that once filled these structures is located down here at the bottom of the northern pump shaft. And this northern shaft here, the big vertical steep shaft, again, so getting in and out of this thing is a pain in the ass. And that is with the assistance of the modern stairs that have been, there are no stairs in this thing. If you take the modern wooden stairs out, it is a incredibly steep three by three shaft. How are you getting the body down in there? And when we look at the diagram of the, the great pyramid, the only access leads into the subterranean chamber. And there's a well, a vertical well shaft that goes up to the inner chambers. So are you proposing that you slide your pharaonic body down the shaft, you tie a rope on it, you hang, tie a rope around its feet, and then you pull it up through this vertical? Again, how are you getting the body down in there? Not to mention all of the other accoutrement of your burial, all of the statues and whatever else you're burying. You're, you ain't getting it down inside that shaft. Mm. And that's why when you go to the Valley of the Kings, the openings are huge. So your procession can easily walk into the burial chambers. There's a nice gradual slope with stairs leading down into the burial chamber and a huge, huge cavern where you can put all the stuff. It is, this is functional engineering. Well, there's also is, the, the, the term form follows function. Exactly. Why build the exactly. pyramids on, why, why build these huge pyramids on top? Yeah. Ah, uh, Another great question that comes up on the channel a whole lot. So there's a number of different functions. So first, preventing environmental contamination. So let's start with the, the methane gas for the step pyramids. You're producing a large volume of methane gas. You don't necessarily want that seeping out into the atmosphere. Same thing with all of these other volatile chemicals. Specifically, when we get to the acidic gases, hydrogen chloride gas, 
or sulfur trioxide gas, you do not want that seeping into the atmosphere. So the first thing is preventing environmental contamination. You encase your reaction chambers with something that prevents the gases from going into the atmosphere. Second, internal stability and longevity of your reaction chambers. These reaction chambers are not standalone structures. You have to have something to support the massive weight of the water that is moving in through these things. And this, for example, this northern shaft here, this is not standalone. You have to have something encasing and holding this shaft in place to make it functional. Third, containing the internal pressure. So there was a massive amount of pressure involved in these reactions. And if you did not have your reaction chambers encased in a large body of stone, it could shake the whole thing to pieces and blow the top off of your pyramid, which we'll see here in just a minute. And there's some evidence this is actually has happened mm. at some sites where there has been destruction from the inside of these pyramids. So there's a number of different operative functions, but then also we'll get to the transmission of electromagnetic energy. And there's a reason why they built them in a pyramid shape as well. So later on in the presentation, we, there's a machine that produces an electromagnetic energy field called the life stream generator. And we took samples of limestone, black basalt, red granite, and calcite crystal and placed them on top of this machine. And they have very interesting properties in proximity to the electromagnetic energy field being produced by this machine. So extrapolate that to the pyramids on the planet. The Earth also has an electromagnetic energy field, a grid surrounding the planet that emanates in what they call ley lines, which are basically the field lines that surround the Earth. And all of the ancient structures on the planet are constructed on convergencies of these field lines, where the transmission of electromagnetic energy is the strongest on the planet, specifically in Giza, but then also in the, I believe it's called St. Michael's line that runs through Ireland which is a ley line of electromagnetic energy. And all these structures are strategically placed on these convergences of the electromagnetic energy field. So we'll get to that here in just a second. But this is talking about the, the red pyramid fluid dynamics modeling. And this was the, the most primitive model that we made was just using some containers. My buddy, John put this together and we're working on a full scale model of the red pyramid that is going to demonstrate the fluid dynamics and pressure capabilities of this structure. And this was just a very simple demonstration. And you put some gauges on the top of this thing and have videos of this all on my YouTube channel. So my YouTube is the land of chem, C-H-E-M. And we have fluid dynamics modeling series, part one and part two. So he made this mock-up just to test to see what happens when you fill these things up. And the water flows exactly the way I've, I've proposed it. And he put a pressure gauge on top of these containers. And of course, the pressure goes up in the top of the container because that is what happens based on physics principles 101. Very, very basic physics. You compress a gas, temperature and pressure go up. So we've been able to model this. And this is part two of the fluid. So he's building a model. And this is the inlet shaft at the bottom of the northern pump shaft here on the right. And we're going to have, I, I can't say how long it's going to take because these, these things take time to do them properly. Can, can you just walk us through the basic, is this just an accumulating uh, system that just accumulates this gas or is there... Are there reactions going on? Uh, I, I still haven't quite got well, a picture. Because there's the, the method. So I imagine that the inlet sluice contains a mixture of water, dung, and these agricultural waste products, which is what, like grass clippings and like just biomass? I guess I'm just trying to understand okay, so the final go, output so product. Back here. Yeah. So let me go back here a sec. So I, w I always make sure because people can lose track of the sequence and the different pyramids that we're discussing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the step pyramid of Saqqara was producing the methane gas. And that was a, a biological chemical reaction. And the methane gas basically just rises into the top of the chamber. And it was originally connected out of an outlet shaft on the platform. So you have a valve, you can extract the gas. 
there are underground shafts that lead out of Saqqara toward Dashur. And as we saw in the beginning stages of the reaction sequence of the Haber process, methane gas from the step pyramid is then transformed inside of the red pyramid in a sequence of three different reactions. Okay, so the Got Temple it. of Saqqara the- is producing the methane, and the methane is getting piped into the Temple of Dafur, where the Haber-Bosch process begins. Correct, the Red Pyramid, yes. So wh- how it. far away are these pyramids from each other? So they, they are visible on I the see. horizon from each other. So within a couple of miles, okay. you can see one. And again, they were strategically built this way. The same thing in Ireland, where it, when you are at the Step Pyramid, you can see the red pyramid on the horizon. When you go to the red pyramid, you can see the next one in the distance. When you go to Abu Sir, you can see the great pyramid. So it's literally an indication of the manufacturing sequence. That Once you go to one, you can see the next one, and then you can see the next one. This is the same as true in Ireland as well. So then once we, get to the, once we get to the Haber-Bosch system, what are each of those yeah. chambers accomplishing? Yeah, because we've gotten to the first chamber, so we're mixing methane and water. Methane's coming from the Temple of Saqqara, the water's coming in from the sluice that you showed us and the like the the water patterns. Right here, yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. So this is where we get into the discussion about the northern pump shaft. So how how do you raise the water level? So there was an external reservoir surrounding all of these pyramids. They found walls that surrounded all of these pyramids. And many different researchers have proposed that there was a reservoir surrounding these pyramids. And that reservoir reservoir would have been on top of that inlet that you showed us with the quartzite lintel? So it's hard to say at Abu Sir exactly where that is because that site has, it's basically completely destroyed at Abu Sir. So the, so the reservoir is still, still up for determination at Abu Sir, but at the red pyramid, the Bent Pyramid and the Pyramids of Giza, they all had an external, well, the conventional archaeological story would tell you it's just a wall surrounding the pyramids. A lot of people believe it was a reservoir to hold water. Got it. So that reservoir was filled, and that was used to introduce water into the structure through the inlet shaft that you can see here in this model on the right. That was introduced into the chambers until the height of the water inside of your reaction chamber equaled the height of the water in the external reservoir. This is, again, a very basic principle of physics that the water inside of your containers will only go as high as the water in your external web. So this is where the northern pump shaft comes in because this is also going to fill with water during the process. So there was a pump mechanism that was introduced into that northern shaft to compress the water level within the internal system and push it into the upper part of the chamber. So the first step is the methane preheat of the chamber. So you introduce methane into the chambers. It is ignited to heat the internal chambers. The water level is raised to fill the connecting shaft. More methane is introduced. There's a hole on the northwestern wall of the chamber where there's prolific staining coming up out of this hole leading into the upper vault of the chamber. So this was your methane inlet shaft. And the methane inlet shaft is at the precise location as the initial fill level because there was also percolation involved, not only in the collection of methane to remove contaminants like hydrogen disulfide, but it also percolated up into the chamber. So your chamber is filling with methane gas. It's the heated chamber. So as the water level rises, there's steam coming from the top of the water that is reacted with that methane gas. Now, there's, there's a, f- a few steps in the process I'm kind of leaving out, but again, that, there's sonochemistry that's also involved, acoustic catalysts, and there's catalyst material on the walls of the chamber that are promoting these reactions. So the methane and steam react to produce hydrogen and carbon monoxide. And there's a very high pressure system in the upper vault of the reaction chamber. So as you lower the water level, It's a phenomenon called surface adhesion, where gas will basically stick to the water and the water is drained out of the second chamber. So there's a flow process of water moving from the primary chamber 
through the connecting shaft being drained in the second chamber. So as soon as there is an aperture open in that connecting shaft, these high pressure gases are going to flow along the surface of the water into the lower pressure secondary reaction chamber. So this is how the gases move throughout the chambers. So is there an outlet? So have you identified the outlet in the second chamber? Yep, there's there's a hole, and I'll, I'll go back a couple of slides here. So you see here at the bottom of the second chamber on the mm-hmm. southern wall, this hole. Now, all of these are unexcavated shafts. There are holes in the bottom of these chambers that have never been excavated. They are completely filled with sand. I see. So, this so there's basically is, like an indentation that you assume would be going to a different channel that would allow you to drain the water out and pull the gas and water mixture from the first chamber into the second chamber. More or less. So this is, this is your drainage shaft that drains the water in the, the initial stages of the reaction process. So as the gas flows through this connecting shaft, you don't completely drain the water out of the system. The gases, the hydrogen and carbon monoxide gas are lighter than air. So those gases will then rise into the upper vault of the secondary reaction chamber. And it appears that there was a baffles mechanism. Carbon that was monoxide installed. is heavier than air. Right? I'm pretty sure it's lighter than air. Well, I think it's not because there's uh, there was this really big volcano that erupted. Well, didn't really erupt, but basically it um, started to release carbon monoxide gas. Are you and sure it, it wasn't carbon dioxide? Sorry, I gotta look this up. Yeah, because everybody, I think everybody suffocated. You suffocated from carbon dioxide too. That's true. But I, I don't. I that doesn't necessarily. I think. Well. If you have if you have enough of the gas, you can imagine that it would displace. It is lighter than air. Carbon. It is. Yeah, you're thinking of carbon dioxide from those volcanoes. I and am thinking. Okay. Uh, you're right. Weird you're right. Stuff, you're right. Yeah. So, so we'll we'll get to that in just a second. Okay. I'm so, sorry. So your your secondary gases, so hydrogen and carbon monoxide, mm. are also mixed with. So there's also air inside of this chamber, which contains a significant amount of nitrogen. So the secondary stage of the reaction is to begin filling your system again. Your pump mechanism moves down the northern pump shaft, which compresses the gases into the upper vault of the secondary reaction chamber. The carbon monoxide reacts with oxygen from the air to produce carbon dioxide, leaving hydrogen and nitrogen in the upper vault of the reaction chamber. There's some other gases that are involved, and it's this isn't a perfect reaction the same way that we would have today. This is not modern chemical engineering. This is ancient chemical engineering. So you still have your reactant gases, your hydrogen and nitrogen. Carbon dioxide is a water-soluble gas. So this b- dissolves into the water in the secondary chamber which eliminates that byproduct from the system. Because again, this is a high pressure reaction chamber. So the carbon dioxide under high pressure is going to dissolve in the water in the chamber, leaving your hydrogen and nitrogen reactants here in the upper vault of the secondary chamber. You can then drain that carbon dioxide containing, or the water containing the carbon dioxide is drained from the secondary chamber, and that's used in another reaction coming up. And this is exactly the way we do it in the modern process, where water is used to dissolve the carbon dioxide byproduct, and it's used in an adjacent manufacturing facility for the production of urea. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what we're going to see here in just a minute with the bent pyramid of Dashur. So your gases are basically trapped because hydrogen and nitrogen are both lighter than air. So they will remain in the upper vault of your secondary reaction chamber. The chambers are filled with water again. The pump is pressed all the way down to the bottom of the northern pump shaft. And by pressing that pump all the way down to the bottom of the northern pump shaft, that is going to force your bubble of reactant gases 
through the connecting shaft into the final reaction chamber and fill this with water as well, pushing the gases into the upper reaction chamber. Your hydrogen and nitrogen then react to produce ammonia, ammonia gas. That ammonia gas is also highly soluble in water. So you have a water-filled chamber. Your ammonia reaction is occurring to produce the ammonia gas. And this also prevents the breakdown because ammonia gas is a very easy molecule to split back up. So by immediately dissolving your ammonia gas product into an aqueous solution, it promotes the forward momentum of the reaction sequence. Mm. Because under high temperature and pressure, ammonia will break back down into hydrogen and nitrogen. But if you're dissolving that ammonia, as soon as it's being produced into an aqueous solution, you're filling your final reaction chamber with an aqueous solution of ammonia, ammonia gas dissolved in water, which is a big difference between the modern Haber process where they actually just create the ammonia gas and they super cool it to produce liquid ammonia, mm. which is a very different product than an aqueous ammonia solution. Again, big distinct uh, distinctions between the modern manufacturing process and this ancient chemical engineering. So you have a big thing filled with aqueous ammonia solution, and there's a pit down here. And there's many researchers that have proposed. So again, this is why my book is written as a fictional story, because it gives you some artistic liberty to propose things that have not yet been proven by archaeological excavations. No one is ever going to come in here and excavate this pit. There is tons of evidence that there is a pit and a shaft leading out of the secondary chamber and also here at the bottom of the northern pump shaft. Many other researchers have proposed that there is a shaft leading out of the final chamber as well. But this has never been proven. They're never going to go in there and excavate that. It's one of these things that it takes a little bit of speculation. Why, However, do, you say, why do you say that they won't excavate it ever? Oh, the excavations are done inside of these structures. They're never going to go in. They, so I was just at Abu Sir the other day, literally two days ago, and they have completely sealed off the entrance. The, the opening into the structure is completely sealed with concrete. Wow. What's completely the reasoning sealed. just to, just to, is it a naturalist? philosophy is it like leave the past alone or what's the reason well they're they're they're, they're trying to prevent further ex so there is so, <laughs> so what's the motivation so, here yeah so so even for example now in this secondary chamber there is a huge scaffold constructed over this area and that's the only way to access this final chamber is by using the modern scaffold that's been constructed inside of this thing. So they build this scaffold system to cover up this area, and there will, there will never be any excavations inside of these structures. They just don't do it. Same thing with the new Great Pyramid discovery. You know, is they that did for a, lack of curiosity? Is it like, we already we understand this, there's no point, that kind of thing? It could be, a, it could be just a tourist money incentive, because you have to pay to go see these pyramids, right? And so if you, if you close it, and you're like, we're going to do an extensive excavation, you have to dismantle all the infrastructure, you have to make it inaccessible to people for a long period of time. And that I makes think sense. that's probably... Well, I, I can so imagine that being kind of an inadvertent out, motivation. We just mm -hmm. found out two days ago that the Egyptian Ministry of Antiquities is closing the Great Pyramid of Giza for the entire month of June for maintenance repairs. Where they're actually going in and doing just that. They're updating the access infrastructure, cleaning the inside of the pyramids, doing all these sorts of things. The, the excavation inside of the pyramids is done. They will never do any more intrusive excavations into these structures. Um, even, for example, with the Great Pyramid, we're going to get to some stuff here in just a minute where there have been Doppler radar scans done illegally of the Great Pyramid that reveal far more than the new Muon scan project and that new shaft that was just discovered. And they will never carve a hole into the outside of the structure to investigate that. Never. That's you don't think it's possible some some preeminent Egyptologist will 
Yeah, that was going to be one day question. find a, a great deal of intrigue in, in your ideas or, you know, you don't think it could grow to the point where these questions had to be answered? So let's go back to the story of the original investigation of the Egyptian pyramids. So early, very early 1900s, late 1800s. The book is being written by people that were not chemical engineers, that were not scientists. They were historians and treasure hunters. So the book is written. It is set in stone that these things are burials. And that is the predominant narrative of all Egyptology. The entire tourism, tourism industry and infrastructure of Egypt is built around this story. It will never change. Uh, I think it will, man. I like we that, see this thing in science too, where you know so they used to said, like up until like at some point the evidence amounts to become gross to look at. Like it's very difficult for the professionals right. to look at some pile of evidence and. You know, they used to think the entire universe was inside of our galaxy until less than 100 years ago. And, you know, you see these paradigms playing out, especially at the frontiers of outer space, where the old ideas, no, even though they're huge and they've been going on for a thousand years, they just, the, the evidence, start, it just it gets kind of gross to try to squirm out of the evidence at some point. And then all of a sudden there's a flashpoint where people are like, okay, okay, let's look at this and, and maybe take this seriously. Are so you, I wouldn't be so down about it. You also yeah. have to understand that the way the Egyptian government works and without being able to come here and see these monuments and these tourist sites in person, you will never see the absolute disregard for these ancient monuments. There is trash all over the place. Mm. they are completely disregarded and the Egyptian government has absolutely no interest in trying to preserve or protect these monuments. It is, it's a travesty. What, what's, what's happening at these monuments. You walk around the Giza plateau, you know, there's stray dogs, there's trash that is never collected. And this is stuff that you don't see in the, it's the reality of being here in Egypt. The Egyptian government does not care whatsoever. What about now, the Egyptian archaeology the, community? They don't care either. Um, so they are excavating extant sites that are known to be burials. So there is still investigation going on. And I'm actually in, in touch with the lead archaeologist in Saqqara. And I was sharing with him the diagrams that we have of the LIDAR scans that show these underground shaft systems that connect the primary reaction chamber and the southern tomb, and also that lead out of the area of Saqqara. And he's very aware of these things. And they know that these things exist in these underground shafts, but that is not the priority of the Ministry of Antiquities is not to look for these shaft systems. They are there to find burials and they are excavating areas that are known to contain burials because that's what brings in the tourism money. People want to see the mummies. They want to find the riches. They're not here to investigate ancient alchemy. They're there to find treasure. Same thing the way the excavators and historians were in the past. Now, that being said, even archaeologists like Zahi Huas, who was the um, head of the Egyptian Ministry of Antiquities, they love the alternative community because they also bring in a significant amount of tourist dollars. So they will allow people to come up with whatever theories they want to have about. They love the metaphysical community that believes that these are energy structures. They love the meditation community. They come here to do the meditations and yada yada inside. The, they love it. Bring it on. The more tourist dollars, the better. But none of that tourist money goes into man, maintaining these sites. They're in here to build new Cairo. They're here to renovate Giza. They're, again, they have other priorities on their hands than investigating the true purpose of these structures. And I do believe that there's people in the know that, because again, the evidence, for example, inside of the red pyramid is so prolific for a functional structure as opposed to a burial. It's literally a smoking gun for the functional aspect of these structures. It, it cannot be ignored. But that is also why when you go to Egypt, your tour guide does not go in the structures with you. It is illegal. Well, they, they don't. Hmm. It's forbidden, basically. Not necessarily legal. But you go on an Egyptian tour, your your go to any okay. structure. You're not allowed so, to go into any structure. You said, not me. But if you if you get a normal Egyptian tour guide from any tour company, 
Those tour guides are not allowed to go inside of the structures with you. How do you have permission to go inside the structures? I'm not a tour guide. I mean, I am, but I'm just a tourist. I see. So if you come I mean, just host, as somebody, so as, as you come as somebody to like to to the site without a group, you're able to enter the sites. Correct. So as a t so me, for example, I, I live here, right? So I can go pay my access ticket to Saqqara, go walk up to the Pyramid of Winis and go inside because you pay entry fee to go inside. What I do, I'm a third party where I outsource a local tour company. They provide the transportation, the security, the Egyptologist guide, which you absolutely have to have if you're a tourist group. And I'm just a third party that facilitates bringing the people in. So I am not restricted from going in and out of these pyramids, but the licensed Egyptologist guide that has to come with you is not allowed to go inside the pyramids. Why, why is that? Because they can't explain anything in there. People ask questions that they don't have answers to. They're just there mm. to tell you the narrative. This is the Pyramid of Djoser. It was built by Imhotep. This is the Pyramid of Winis. These are burials. You get 30 minutes on site, get some pictures from Instagram, and then you go to the next site. That is how mm. conventional Egypt tours work. I see it every single day when I go to the sites. The bus pull up, the people get off, they go take some pictures on the outside of the monuments. They're there for 15 minutes to a half an hour, and then they leave. So there's like a very national bureaucracy aspect to this. Absolutely. I, I so again, so people that haven't been to Egypt, that you'll never be able to understand how it works until you actually see it in person. And I hope we can do that. Someday. This is a beautiful country, and I absolutely love it here. And I would certainly never say anything against the the way that they're doing things, but it's 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 very um, they're very intent in what they're doing. There's there's a way that these these sites are operated even to get special permission access. So Abu Sir, for example, is an illegal site. You cannot go to Abu Sir as a just public tourist. You have to get special permission from the Ministry of Antiquities and Tourism to go and access that site. And that's the only reason I've been able to go is I have connections with people that have, for example, my friend Isam, he's the director of the monuments at Abu Sir. He had a tour group, again, these 25 Chinese tourists and he knew that I was interested in going. He had arranged special permission access for them to go out there. And he said, hey, just come along with the group. So I was able to get access to that site. When I went inside the Osiris shaft, underneath the Giza Plateau, it cost a fortune. I don't want to say how much it cost because it was a fortune for them to open up a gate to let me go inside of this thing. And again, they don't, the, your guide doesn't come in with you. I had my friend Yusuf Awian came with me because he's not a, a conventional tour guide but if you go to the great pyramid on a tour your guide stands on the outside he said go inside come back as quickly as you can people go in there for two seconds they turn right back around and come out they don't look at anything oh there's nothing in here there's no burial in here you know, what is all this engineering what is all this stuff no explanation and they leave that's how it works and that's why the narrative will never change is because they don't want it to change they have no, there's no impetus for them to change the story. You imagine rewriting the textbook? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's something we think a ton about, actually. I just, you know, I just find a lot of hope in the history books, actually, because some of the people that I look up to who did actually change these massive narratives, they did it in a particular fashion. And I think that you've touched upon one of those ways, which is through fiction, but also by just really carefully refining the idea, building it up. You know, the Coper uh, Copernicus didn't publish his idea about the solar system until he was basically on his deathbed and he self-published it. Through Darwin one with the theory of evolution was the same thing. Yeah, so I, I do see these moments where there, there are these explosions and things fall apart in terms of the standard narrative. But it, you're right, it's not easy and you have the whole weight of civilization fighting you. So you have to kind of plan so a long game. If you take Graham Hancock and Randall Carlson, for example, these two individuals have been completely ostracized from the academic community yeah, for but promoting I think, the... I, I think that that's a huge... Con like, I get a lot of flack every time I say this, but I think that it has to do with the way that Graham Hancock presents his ideas. Like, oh, I've 100%. Listened, I've yeah, listened oh, to of a lot of Graham so they Hancock. They have plenty of scrutiny to give the guy, right? 
Yeah. And so it's like, I think that that's the, that's what sets you apart from somebody like Graham Hancock is that it, I've, I've watched his presentations and I've seen him kind of stretch the truth in certain ways that I don't really like. But not stretch it in a fiction sense, but stretch it in with this certainty that people who are hungry for the reliability of science, you know, are very, very nervous about. And there's also there's also a tendency, which you've probably seen before, which is that as soon as you set yourself against something, you can garner a lot more support. Because if your narrative is, oh, the academic community doesn't care about this, they're trying to silence me, they're, you know, they're against us, you can build a much stronger community on the back of that than you can if you're just like, you know, I have a lot of friends that are academics, but I'm not an academic, and I have a coalition of people that agree, and it's just, it's a very different way of presenting things. And so I think that Graham Hancock benefits tremendously from his outsider status in context of his own career and book sales and success and he's clearly not that ostracized because he has a netflix special like the guy is the guy is as as popular as you can get without being a hardcore academic i I also want to say that this idea that there's a lot of you know that they all are putting holding back my idea and everything this is this happens in academia too a lot right like having gone through the mill of trying to publish in academia a revolutionary idea, people will call you idiots from all fields. For like a long time. Our paper was rejected and rejected and rejected, and people were mean too, right? But they ended up being wrong. And, and so the entire community inside of the academy is also very vicious like that too. It's not just some, oh, well, the academy is mean to me. From the academy the is just mean. Like Science is a mean process in general. And so I think that it's like... I don't think that it's hopeless. I think that it's just probably the project of a lifetime. And that's so that's for, kind of intimidating. For me, <laughs> I, I have no intention or desire to change the conventional narrative. And that's one of the reasons that I try to incorporate what is known in the conventional story about dynastic Egypt. For example, the scarab beetle and the deification of cattle and you know, this agricultural civilization. I try to make my ideas very compatible with what we know of dynastic Egypt, but just pushing back the timeline a little bit and really taking a more realistic look at the capabilities of some of these structures. And again, I have no intention to change anybody's mind. I'm just a dude that came up with an idea and I'm just here to tell a story. And if one day it catches on and becomes something bigger than that, you know, that would be my life's dream. And that would be, again, If any small piece of this were ever proven to be right, it would be such a tremendous victory. I mean, again, I've never said that all of this is 100% right. For me to even say that all of this is 100% right is a very vain and pompous thing for me to try to do. Because even to understand, and this is why most researchers focus just on the Great Pyramid, they spend their entire lives developing one theory on one structure. And they never look at all the rest of them because it is such a tremendous undertaking to try to understand the bigger picture. Again, why I wrote a fictional story. You have described the difficulties of all of science right now. Like this is what what you were describing is you were describing a problem that plagues, I think, every discipline. And what I also really appreciate is that you come out and you don't, say that this is 100% correct because I think that that humility is something that is so vital for the transmission of new and challenging ideas. It's that, hey, I'm not telling you that this is 100% correct. I'm just saying that we should look at it because the story that we have right now seems woefully incomplete. And so I really, really value that. And and every day that I go, because I go out to the pyramid sites basically twice a week now, And every time that I'm inside of these structures, I learn something new. And there is, luckily, I'm working in conjunction with some teams that have illegally taken samples from inside. So even, okay, so taking samples from inside of a pyramid is highly illegal. Highly illegal. If they catch you with a sample of something that was not taken, under strict direction from the Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities, you are fucked. They are going to either throw you in Egyptian prison or they will ban you from coming into the country. So even the, the legwork of going out here and doing this investigation, I fly under the radar. As far as they know, I'm just a fucking tourist who wrote a science fiction story. And for me, 
that is the perfect place for this to live because my work is just a vehicle for the transmission of the idea. It is a, a platform for me to do everything that I'm doing. And it brought me here to Egypt already. So currently I'm on the right path of, you know, the higher power that put me in this direction in the first place. And they seem to like what I'm doing because again, it allowed me to come here and fulfill my childhood dream of coming and researching Egypt. So for me to just be a tourist and, you know, I'm not doing anything. We, we pay for special permission access when we want to get access to special sites. You know, I'm walking around filming on my GoPro, just looking like the next tourist. That is a perfect place for me to live and to do this type of research. Because again, there's, there's a lot of things that are very illegal. So you can't even take a drone. You show up to, with a drone, it is confiscated. You show up with, you can't even take a tape measure to the Giza Plateau. Hmm. You go up there with a the measuring tape and even just try to bet. What are you doing? You know, they'll, they'll confiscate your tape measure. They'll make you delete all of the pictures on your phone. It is, it's unbelievable the way that, well, it's not because again, they're, they're very intentional about the type of research that they allow to go on. For example, this Muon scan team, they allowed them to scan an area of the Great Pyramid. They already knew that shaft was there. It's a six, six meter long corridor that is, they are, A, they already knew it was there. And B, they will never let a team that is not an Egyptian team, this wasn't Egyptians, this was an international team, they are never going to let non-Egyptians make a huge discovery in Egypt. Never. Mm -hmm. If anyone makes a big discovery, it will be the Ministry of Antiquities and Tourism. An Egyptian team will make the discovery. And so, again, so, this, and this, so this, and the, this, I think, speaks to another part that's really, really vital in this kind of outsider science, which is the building of coalitions, where I think that you have to work within the confines of the structures that exist. And so the more people that are on your side that are Egyptians that are studying it from the Egyptian perspective the likelier it is that someone will see the utility in the idea and see the beauty in the idea and then yeah. be able to bring it forward. Because it's like, for any extreme scientific idea, we live in a time where you have to have a coalition of people. Like 50 years ago, you could publish a paper and it could be super disruptive and you could cite no one who came before you and people would be like, oh, that's really quite interesting. And we're like, we're out of that time in history. Like that, that is... That's the wild west of publication science. And so now we, we all have to operate under the constraints, Shiloh and me included, where it's like, yo, you have got to get people that are inside of the academy, that are in these positions to look at these ideas and be intrigued by them. And that's, that's easy to say, but really, really hard to do, because how do you find those people? Like the podcast is our way of finding those people. And so every single interview that we do, there's always the hope of like, are we going to find somebody who's, who's, who's on the, the same, you know, the same vibration that we're on or not? And many people aren't. And so you, you talk to them and you're like, okay, that's fine. And they leave. But we're, we're slowly starting to accumulate this kind of core group of people that sees what we're doing, that believes in it and is, is willing to support it. And that's a really, really cool process that I wonder yeah. if, if it's something that's in your future as well. So even, you know, in my five years of coming to Egypt and the past three months that I've been here, um, I've developed some really, really good connections with some influential people here in Egypt that, that are part of the team. And they are a part of the people that are, you know, making these decisions and, you know, operators of sites, the directors of, you know, security, et cetera, et cetera, archaeologists that work on site. Again, in my in the special permission to visit to Abu Sir, I happened to make a connection with the lead archaeologist working in Saqqara. I met him three years ago. We were talking about the scans. He immediately knew who I was because I was presenting information that most people don't know about. He was like, oh, how do you know about this? And I'm like, well, I'm into this. I love Anabeheb pyramids. I mean, I love pyramids. And they know how passionate I am about these structures. And my passion and enthusiasm and positivity is what I've used to develop the connections with these people because they see that I love this and they know that I'm here and I've given up everything to come to Egypt to go walk around the pyramids. So anytime they see somebody that is as excited about this stuff as I am, they're really willing to work with me. And again, even just knowing the guards at the sites, 
the keepers of the site and having a good relationship with them. They give me a little bit of extra time to be in there and, you know, they're not bugging me and they're not, oh, you can't film in here. Like all this sort of stuff. Hmm. There are tons of restrictions of what you can and can't do at the sites. And by having good relationships with people and just being a nice guy that the, the people like seeing me, you know, it, it makes things a lot easier for me. So again, it's, it's a work in progress where there are people within the academic and archaeological world that are certainly open to these ideas, specifically here in Egypt. All of these archaeologists, they know that there's something more to the story. They're here doing a specific job that is, they're getting, again, it's, it's again, same thing as academia. You're getting paid by a group to do this research. This is what you're here to do. This is what you're paid to do. Your ideas are probably a little bit outside of that. Sometimes you test it, sometimes you don't. If you test it and go outside of that, that's when papers get rejected and people lose their careers for trying to propose ideas that are outside of the conventional narrative. So most of the time they just keep quiet about it and they just do their research. Oh, we're here to look at the burials. This is what we found, yada, yada. But again, that's why they don't let the Egyptologist guides go in there is because there's so many unanswered questions about these things that for a tourist that is coming there to hear the conventional narrative and they go inside. So for example, when I'm inside the red pyramid doing my research and filming and talking about the chemical staining and they're like, the people come in and they hear me talking about this stuff. I have been stopped so many times by tourists that will follow me around just because they're interested in the things that I'm saying. And they're like, well, they told us on the outside that this is bat staining. I'm like, Okay, here we go. So then I go into the whole spiel of explaining what all of these chemicals are. And they're like, holy shit, like nobody, nobody ever told it. And of course, it's not bats. There are no bats in here. Bats don't make staining coming out of the stone. So again, as soon as these people start hearing, uh, and it happens basically every time that I'm on site, I'll get stopped by a small group. Hey, we heard you recording. What are you talking about? What is your research about? So uh, you know, the, the more time I spend here, the more people are going to know who I am. Um, I see that as a good thing because, again, the the Ministry of Antiquities and Tourism, I'm, I'm no threat and I, I have no intention to be a threat. If anything, I'm bringing in more tourists that want to come and see this stuff and hear that. And Christopher Dunn, for example, the, the, the pioneer in the alternative theories about the Great Pyramid, he was working with Zahi Hawass in the Ministry of Antiquities. They paid, they paid money to take samples. They paid money to get special permission. Again, it's all about the money. As long as you pay the fee, you can go and do the stuff that you want to do. And they don't perceive Christopher Dunn as a threat because, again, he's just bringing in more tour. Any any attention that can be brought to the country is a good thing. Mm. So what are we looking at here? This piece of stone right here was intentionally carved at a 45-degree angle. And this is a tiny component. At the bottom of the northern pump shaft, that no one ever pays attention to this very small piece of engineering. If this area had no function, they would have left it at a 90 degree angle. But it is not. It is intentionally carved at essentially a 45 degree angle because it is the stop block mm. for the northern pump mechanism. Mm. So when the pump goes down to the bottom of the shaft, it meets precisely with that stop block mm. and it provides a resting place that completely seals off this Northern pump and it gives it a place to rest right here. What do you suppose that was fabricated from? So this is made out of stone. Um, the pump the stop block, block I would also yeah. propose is made out of stone, but there would have been some lubricants used in it. And there's another, I found this later on in my research. There was, a German engineering team talking about the ram pump mechanism of the Great Pyramid, where they proposed it was made out of wood. Mm -hmm. And there was a wooden component with a, a two-way valve. So then it, when it moved in, it pushed water in. When it moved out, it sucked water in the opposite direction. Mm. So it would have been so fastened to some sort of like tackle block system for, for raising and lowering it? or. Yeah, absolutely. So it, the, again, the, the material is up for speculation because there is no evidence of the physical pump mechanism. There is no piece of stone left. The only evidence that I have is this piece of engineering here, because why go through the extra effort 
to carve this block and to engineer it. Again, form implies function. And if, if they had left this at a 90 degree angle, it would have gotten smashed to pieces every time that pump came to the bottom of the shaft. But it is completely smooth and tailored to the exact angle as a flat mechanism resting at the bottom of the pump. So there are very small details inside of these structures that imply the function of specific components. And no one ever talks about this because it's completely irrelevant if you're not looking at the very, very small details. But as soon as I saw this, I was like, oh, I know exactly what that's for. And I know exactly why they did that because it's a stop block. And there are several other stop blocks inside of these structures. Okay, so now we're getting into some interesting stuff. The staining inside the red pyramid. I am a joint contributing member of a group called the ACIDA Project, which is an international research and data collection team. And they took samples from inside of the red pyramid. And this is the macro element composition of some of the staining inside here. And you'll see most of it is silicon dioxide, but there's also aluminum trioxide and iron trioxide in this staining so there so we have the let me start with the the big one calcium oxide from calcium carbonate the limestone itself 70 percent then you have silicon dioxide which could be naturally occurring but is most likely a part of the internal sealing layer and then we have aluminum and iron oxides in that chemical analysis as well. All the rest of this stuff are, are trace elements, and we'll get to the trace elements here in just a moment. But the aluminum and iron oxide are what are of particular relevance to the conversation. So this was done using x-ray fluorescence of the macro analysis. This is the full breakdown of all of the trace elements that were discovered in these samples. And it is absolutely mind-blowing to try to wrap your head around all of the trace elements that were discovered in this. But it is mostly iron oxide. Okay, so iron oxide is what they currently use as the predominant component of the catalyst material in the Haber process. Hmm. So why is there all of this iron oxide on the inside of the pyramid in this staining pattern? And then I started to look at the electron microscopy. So they also did up close analysis of these micro particles. This one is 50% copper. This one is almost 90% zinc. This one is 60% iron. This one here is 50% antimony. This one is 40% thorium. So I saw, saw that you, as soon as I said antimony, he was like, well, that's a pretty unusual chemical or metal to be inside of this pyramid. Again, the conventional explanation. I guess I just don't understand the, I don't understand the background levels of these things or the, the geology enough to. Right really right. know whether it's out of place or not. Like if you took a sample, do you, do you have a sample that you took from outside the pyramid and compared it like as a background? So, so that's part of the investigation process that I went through is looking at comparative levels of what would be considered to be normal limestone compared to what is found inside of the red pyramid. And it seems that these are significantly higher than what you would find in normal limestone. Normal limestone can absolutely contain iron oxide. It can absolutely contain silicon dioxide. It can contain all of these trace elements. However, what we're looking at here inside the red pyramid is extrusions of these metal compounds. So there is drip staining coming from inside of the stone that is causing this staining pattern on the inside of the pyramids. So what would cause these extrusions to happen unless there was a high temperature, because these are solid compounds inside of the stone. 
you have to heat it to liquefy some of this material. And there has to be fluctuations of pressure, fluctuations of temperature and pressure inside of these reaction chambers is what is causing the extrusions of this natural material. So the iron, most likely natural in the stone itself. This strontium that we see here also can be a part of natural limestone where strontium substitutes the calcium in the calcium carbonate lattice and it becomes strontium carbonate, which is a very normal thing to find in some type of limestone. The question arises, why are these extrusions coming out of the stone? And I do not believe it is from static pressure. So static pressure is only going to produce one extrusion. But there are multiple layers. There are literally hundreds. You can see it in the color of these stains where there's hundreds and hundreds of layers of these extrusions, which imply fluctuations of the temperature and pressure inside of this structure. So there are natural extrusions coming out of the stone. But I believe in this chemical analysis, they're also picking up layers of what was coating the surface. And a bunch of these, so they took about 40 different samples from inside of the red pyramid. And I would have to go through each one of the samples that were taken from each one of the chambers to explain which ones are coming from where. But there are a lot of things inside of this. For example, the 40% thorium, this was taken from a surface sample. Some of them were taken from the core limestone in the pit. Some of them were taken from the surface of the the, the chamber. But this 40% thorium, it's very, very unlikely that in an electron microscopy scan, they are just going to somehow zoom in on a particle that is 40% thorium if that was not prevalent in the overall. Because electron microscopy, you're literally zooming in at very, very tiny, minute particles. So it's highly unlikely that there was a sample that has 40% thorium in it if it was not a prevalent part of the sealing compound on the inside of these chambers. And antimony as well was something that also caught my attention in the investigation. 50% antimony in a sample is very, very unusual for regular limestone. So fast forward a little bit. So we have copper, zinc, iron, antimony, and thorium. Antimony was prevalent in the dynastic Egyptian civilization. They were using antimony sulfide and antimony oxides as a cosmetic compound called kohol, which was basically black eyeliner. They were, the dynastic Egyptians were the first to manufacture cosmetics on an industrial scale. This is another industrial scale manufacturing operation that was being prevalently used in the dynastic period. But when I started to look into the properties of antimony. So antimony was used in the manufacture of printing type to make it harder. Antimony is also a flame retardant in the textile and plastic industry and a pigment used in the manufacture of glass and pyrotechnics. So antimony being on the inside of these chambers, I believe, or I'm proposing in my hypothesis, is that there was an internal sealing layer inside of the red pyramid that had multiple functions. First function being a catalytic coating compound that contained the iron oxide and aluminum, but also had silicon dioxide for its water, well, wa sealing water, um, water retention properties, making the internal chambers more watertight, and also had compounds like antimony which were flame retardants that protected the limestone on the interior of these chambers. So there's, there are a whole bunch of, so in, in analyzing these chemical analyses, it took me almost a year before I put out my first video on the chemical analysis, because there was so much of this to analyze. And so is it part of a natural limestone? What are the um, normal levels of these metals and materials inside of limestone. 
are the percentages that are found on the surface compatible with what we see in the core limestone? So there's a whole series of analysis that went into try to understand what was going on inside of the Red Pyramid. So the ultimate conclusion of all of this is that there was natural iron oxide and strontium inside of this limestone that was being squeezed out in these extrusions due to the fluctuations of temperature and pressure inside of the pyramid. But in the samples, they're also picking up a coating layer that had copper, iron oxide, zinc, antimony, and possibly even thorium. So thorium is the very, very unusual thing because it is a somewhat radioactive material. And this goes into one of my favorite parts of where this rabbit hole has taken, is where does this thorium come from? So another process of my analysis of this is if we find something inside of a pyramid or inside of a chemical analysis, I wanted to be able to document it as being accessible somewhere in Egypt. So we have thorium inside of a pyramid. How the hell did that thorium get there? I wanted to thorium prove. is pretty common in like seawater, though, from what I understand. Oh, I don't yeah, know yeah, the yeah, levels. Well, yeah, it's a, it's a very a very common thing. And I'm a, I'll get to you ex exactly what you're talking about. Um, so again, I, I just wanted to be able to document the existence of the rare metal compound containing minerals coming from somewhere in Egypt to try to not necessarily prove, but show evidence of them having the raw materials to be able to produce these sort of coating compounds. So they know for sure that they were mining antimony sulfides because antimony is found in these cosmetics. Going back full circle, we go back to the play on words for the land of K-H-E-M. The word K-H-E-M refers to the blackness which is conventionally referred to as the black alluvial soil around the Nile River, this dark, rich, fertile soil. So this is the land of the blackness. But there is also these placer mineral deposits, the black sand of Egypt. And these are located all along the Mediterranean coast of Egypt. And this black sand is filled with all of these heavy minerals from which these rare metals are extracted. So the rare, so the placer deposits of Egypt are a source of today for these nuclear raw materials. And there's several different minerals that they find in these black sands, monazite, zircon, rutile, ilmatite, magnetite, and garnet. And so ilmenite crystal, for example, there was a chemical analysis of the Egyptian saw blades. So they found material in the saw cuts all throughout Egypt. And several different researchers have taken chemical analysis of these deposits. And they found copper, arsenic, titanium, and iron. So the blade itself was made of arsenical copper which was well known in the ancient world, something called arsenical bronze. So the conventional narrative that you hear in the normal history is that they were using copper saws. And everybody's like, oh, well, how do you cut things with copper saws? Copper isn't a very good metal to make a saw blade with. and It's not. But if you make an alloy of 90% copper and 10% arsenic, it completely changes the properties of the copper, making it much harder and much easier to pour into a mold. So it was an arsenical copper blade, and they were using a slurry compound made from ilmenite crystal. And ilmenite crystal is made of titanium and iron oxides. Mm. So that was actually what does the cutting process, is this ilmenite crystal, and then you have the copper, arsenical copper blade. But I was just looking in the research to make sure that I could document the existence of all of these minerals that we were finding on the inside of the Red Pyramid as being accessible in ancient Egypt. And I found it very unusual that, again, this black sand could be another reason for the word K-H-E-M, the land of the Chem, the land of this black alluvial soil, but they also have this mineral-rich black sand from which they can extract all of these different compounds. 
And this kind of leads into what I'll be talking about on the Giza Plateau, these deposits of iron oxide and a host of other rare metals that are in these natural deposits right next to the pyramids. So now moving on to the bent pyramid, because I've talked a little bit about the red pyramid. So step pyramid of Saqqara was producing methane. Red pyramid of Dashur was making ammonia, aqueous ammonia solution. This is the bent pyramid of Dashur. And I described previously how there was a carbon dioxide byproduct that was being removed from the red pyramid. And even today in our modern manufacturing, we remove that carbon dioxide byproduct and it is transformed in an adjacent facility using the ammonia solution, mixing it with the carbon dioxide to produce urea, which is a solid fertilizer. So having an aqueous ammonia solution is great. It has a ton of different applications, but if you're trying to transport this with your ancient civilization, it's much easier to do that with a solid compound than it is to do with an aqueous solution. So that was the justification for the construction of the bent pyramid adjacent to the red pyramid is transforming your aqueous ammonia solution into a solid compound fertilizer. Mm. And in my investigation of the bent pyramid, like I said, this is a work in progress. And every time that I go inside of these structures, I learn more. And nitric acid is another very important acidic solution in processing metals. And I'll be discussing the potential of the bent pyramid. This is something I haven't even talked about on my channel yet. Um, but I'm leaning more toward the, and this is one of the things. So in my discussion with Ed, I had all of this stuff prepared. And this idea about nitric oxide or nitric acid being produced inside of the bent pyramid. But he wasn't having it because of the power of nitric acid. It is a very, very strong acid. And at the time, I didn't have my understanding of the physics that was involved in the operation of these structures to justify the catalyst process that was used to transform ammonia into nitrogen dioxides. So he was like, this, this doesn't work. This isn't something that you can justify. So I took it out of the first book and I ended up going with urea because we agreed that the carbon dioxide byproduct from the red pyramid would be useful in creating either ammonium bicarbonate or urea, solid compound fertilizer. But the more time that I spend inside the bent pyramid, the more I'm leaning toward its ability to produce nitric acid. And I'll be describing this. So I also have a second book coming out. And this is one of the updates to the theory that this is a work in progress. And the more I learn about these structures, if I ever come along something and I feel like I am wrong, I will be the first to admit it. And I'll be the first to say, okay, whatever I proposed before, I've come to a better conclusion based on the evidence that we found inside of these structures. And I think that's kind of a hallmark of, you know, being a good, honest person and, and promoting the right research is if you find something that you feel to be incorrect, again, everything that I'm doing is very speculative. The entire process of trying to reverse engineer the Egyptian pyramids is a absolutely speculative process. And even Christopher Dunn, for example, the pioneer in all of these things, there is a ton of speculation involved in his work. So now we're looking at the Great Pyramid of Giza. And like I mentioned before, the only inlet into this structure goes down into the subterranean chamber. And there's no way to access the inner chambers unless you go up through this well shaft. So let's go back to the, the, the proposition that this is a pharaonic burial. So you take your, your pharaoh in his golden sarcophagus, you slide it down into the subterranean chamber. You would then have to tie it to a rope or something and pull it up through the well shaft to get it into the upper chambers. Not the most ceremonial process that I could imagine for the burial of a, th a pharaoh. And my hypothesis for the function of the Great Pyramid is that this structure was designed to produce a dilute solution of sulfuric acid. And the quote-unquote King's Chamber was a furnace for the production of sulfur dioxides. 
that were then dissolved into a large volume of water here in the quote unquote grand gallery and extracted through the queen's chamber. So these extraction chambers are one of the propositions that I've made in my book and in my hypotheses that are somewhat speculative. However, the recent 3D Doppler scan of the Great Pyramid has actually shown the presence of this extraction chamber shaft system. And I'll get to that here in just a second. You guys look like you have some questions. Fire away. Well, I was the thing that I was going to ask is in the diagram of the Great Pyramid, you have this descending shaft that goes down into the, the is it labeled the well, I think? Yeah, so the subterranean chamber. The subterranean chamber. Okay, yep. but then you also have this ascending limb that goes directly yes. up into the king's chamber. So, yes. But, but you said that there was no passage between the entrance shaft and the king's chamber except by going through the subterranean chamber. Correct. So the ascending passage is plugged with granite blocks. Interesting. So it, it's hard to see in this diagram, but there's a, there's a huge granite plug here at the bottom of the ascending passage. And uh, several researchers have proposed that this entire thing was plugged and that, that that plug could move up and down that system. Interesting. So again, there's a lot of alternative theories about the Great Pyramids that propose a number of different functions. But this, and if, this it, if it were passage. unplugged, would you be able to get your pharaoh up into the chamber, though? So the, the granite block completely fills that. I mean, it is it is literally plugged in there. I guess presumably and it would have been plugged after the pharaoh was was dragged up into the chamber. Yeah. So again, how do you how do you how do you accomplish all of that? You know, if the the, the the plugging and the sealing process. So, for example, inside the bent pyramid, they have these sliding stone valves that they say were propped up with pieces of wood. And then you were to knock the stone valve out, you knock your piece of wood out of the place, run out of there real quick, and the stone valve slides into place, locking it forever. If there was any small mistake in the process or somebody trapped in there, again, it does, when you start to analyze the pharaonic burial hypothesis, there are so many pieces of the puzzle that are just inexplicable. But to answer your question, so the modern entrance was actually excavated around this ascending passage. So there was a huge hole excavated here on the northern side, and there's an intrusive passage that takes you directly into the bottom of the Grand Gallery. So they, when they did the, the I forget, well, it's the Caliph El Mamun, excavated into this structure they completely circumvented the ascending passage because it is it is plugged okay. so my hypothesis on the function of the great pyramid again was that it's producing a dilute solution of sulfuric acid in a process that's very reminiscent to our modern contact process where the king's chamber was for the production of sulfur dioxides and the two air shafts, I actually just did a video describing this process and to answer a question as to why is the Grand Gallery slanted, which is a very sophisticated piece of engineering that allows the precise amount of air to be drawn in through the external air shafts into the furnace chamber of the Great Pyramid. That also pulls the sulfur dioxides through your antechamber, which functions as an acoustic catalyst chamber. So now we're moving ahead a little bit further into the integration of different types of geology into the operation of these structures. Yeah, can you tell us a bit about acoustic catalyzation? I, I haven't heard of yeah, that. Yeah, so let me, let me skip ahead here. And so this is the three, three, three D diagrams that were presented by the team that did the Doppler radar scans of the Great Pyramid. So again, this was done illegally using Doppler radar technology. They scan, scanned the Great Pyramid, and this is the extraction shaft that is inside of the Queen's Chamber. And there's a hole down in the back of the Queen's Chamber that many researchers have proposed a shaft system is there. I propose that this is the extraction shaft that was used to remove the solution from inside of the pyramid. And you can see here on the left, 
this is the scan that shows the, the, the results of the Doppler radar. And here on the right in red is what they're proposing was the shaft leading, leading out of here. And this is what they're proposing is still hidden inside of the Great Pyramid. So and you can see. Looks like a refin it. refinery's worth of piping. Oh, yeah. There is a vast amount more in this representation than what you see. So this is the conventional diagram with the King's Chamber, the Grand Gallery, and the Queen's Chamber. But then if you look at the new 3D model, there's this huge void above the Grand Gallery, which has also been corroborated by the recent, recent muon scans. They've been talking about this void above the Grand Gallery. You can also see below the Queen's Chamber here, there is a shaft leading to another chamber and a shaft leading out of the structure, which I hypothesized before this came out that there was an extraction shaft system leading out of the Queen's Chamber. And that has been recently corroborated by this Doppler radar scan. So going back to our discussion on the Red Pyramid, I wish that people would start going in and scanning these things using modern technology because we could really see the potential for hidden chambers, missing components. It's, this can all be verified with modern science, but these guys did this illegally. And they'll probably never be, if they, well, they know who it is because they actually published this, but they, I highly doubt the Ministry of Antiquities is going to let these guys back in Egypt. But you can just do it using Doppler radar scan. So there's a number of, and this also shows here on the far right, the chamber that was recently found by that. This is that entrance passage from the northern side that was recently discovered in this big um, reveal of the recent muon scans is this, this shaft here. So they are corroborating the research of the muon scan teams but it appears that they're finding more stuff because the egyptian ministry of antiquities is only letting them scan certain areas where they already know what they're going to find there everybody already knew about this thing do you think that there's is there any does anybody try to explain this away as being necessary components of the construction process like you look at a skyscraper going up and they have all of these you know, different chutes and ladders in order to evacuate waste and all of this. Yep. Have you come across those kind of explanations? Yeah, so this is actually a, a great point. And this, this next diagram that you see here, so there is this step-like structure at number one and number two. And I've proposed that there was water involved in the construction of these monuments. And there are tons of underground shafts that lead from the harbor area up to these monuments. And there's a number of, so it's all about the buoyancy. So Lebanese cedar was prized in the ancient world due to its buoyancy properties. And there are a number of different researchers that have, again, this kind of isn't really my field, but there's several researchers that have proposed that these stones were floated into place using rafts or wood as basically floats. So you can see here in number four that there's shafts leading from underground where hypothetically stones could have been floated up these water-filled shaft systems and in a system of water locks. So there is one researcher that proposed a pretty darn good idea that a system of water locks were used to raise the stones up to certain heights inside of the pyramid which is what you see here in number one and number two, which could have been a water lock system from the construction process that is still extant inside of the body of the pyramid. So the remains from the construction process, I 100% I agree with that. There's mm. of course going to be remains of how they actually built these things. Again, they, a lot of people propose the internal ramp theory, but none of these scans have shown any evidence of that internal ramp. This is the first one that's shown these, these what could be water locks. This is this guy's theory that I forget what the date of the proposition of his theory was, but it came around way before these scans ever existed. Yeah, that it's, I mean, because it, it obviously looks 
it looks like a pi- a system of piping and and so forth just you know from a completely untrained eye it's hard to imagine that it would have been used for navigating like there's no reason to have all these different navigation routes if you're just trying to get in and stick your body in the center or something i mean and it, also the fact if they've never found a body inside this like well sealed pyramid then that complicates things so another very interesting thing about these constructions too. So all, all of the internal containers or the quote unquote sarcophagus are too big to fit in through any of the openings. So they are a part of the construction process where as the chamber itself was going up, the container was already inside of this thing. And the lid Again, your people aren't going to be, once the pyramid is built and sealed, there's not the ability for people to really go in and, in and out of these things. It's, it's basically a sealed structure. So the lid that was on top of your sarcophagus would have already been in place, locked into place to close that container. And it, there's no way, again, to get your, your pharaonic burial back inside of these things. So now moving on to the central pyramid which I proposed was designed to produce a dilute solution of hydrochloric acid in a very simple reaction where the dilute solution of sulfuric acid from the Great Pyramid was introduced into the primary chamber and collected in an extraction chamber. It's a very simple two-chamber system with a reaction flask and a collection vessel and that's exactly what we find inside the central pyramid of Giza. I mean, the yeah. And by central. the way, what was the end purpose of this hydrochloric acid? Ah, so metallurgy mm. was the primary focus of producing these acidic solutions. Um, a lot of people ask, you know, what what are these acidic solutions used for? You can make a number of different products using these things. Hydrochloric acid. You can also use it to produce ferric chloride which is something that's used in the purification of water, which goes back to the very, very beginning of, well, again, something I haven't really even gotten to on my channel yet, but so river water, the Nile river is what provided the water that facilitated all of these chemical reactions. So the water was either used as a mechanism of operation inside the internal chambers of the pyramids to make the, make the reactions work. It was also used to collect your solutions, these gases that are highly soluble in water, to collect and extract the product. You can't use river water to do chemical reactions, unpurified river water, because it's going to have sticks and debris and all this other crap in there that you don't want inside of your reaction chambers. So you have to purify the water first. So by mixing hydrochloric acid with iron, you can produce ferric chloride which is used as a coagulant for purification of water. So these, the water would have either been purified using purification methods or distilled before being introduced into the pyramids. However, and I've been exploring the Giza Plateau several times since I've been here in Egypt, there are huge deposits of iron oxide and a variety of other metals on the Giza Plateau, right next to these pyramids. And there are acidic flow patterns that move from the temple through the extraction shafts, because there's little conduits that are carved out of granite, leading from the temple directly into these huge deposits of iron oxide. Mm. So I believe that there was mining going on on the Giza Plateau where they were using these acidic solutions to leach out the metals that were contained in these deposits of metal. So it was a huge civilization that was predicated on mining and leaching is a very easy way to extract metals and other minerals out of natural deposits. So your hydrochloric acid would have been used to do that. Same thing with the sulfuric acid and also for the production of pure gold. Why do you so think that there was... Why do you think... I'm sorry. I, I'm just really curious. 
Why do you think that there was no textbooks left behind of these processes or no, you know, reverence for this acid? You know, it would have been, it must have been viewed as an extraordinarily powerful substance with, you know, at least in the public facing some divine properties and so forth, right? Do you find any any words that that would approximate that in in the lang- in the hieroglyphics or in the language? So I'm I am no expert in terms of interpreting hieroglyphs, and that that's one of those things that none of these structures have any sort of hieroglyphs inside of them. Hmm. And it appears that most of the hieroglyphs that have been added to the major pyramids have come ar- around at a later date. And there, there are no inscriptions inside of these things. It appears that the pyramids predated the use of hieroglyphs. Because even in the temples, most of the hieroglyphs in the temples are not necessarily compatible with the monumental constructions themselves. Mm. So you figure it was like an oral tradition? It's it's certainly possible, um, but again, there's there's things like you know the the burning of the library in Alexandria, where all of these records from the ancient world were accumulated in this, this huge library that have been completely burned, and it also goes into the idea that I've proposed in before, where there's could have been a misinterpretation, not necessarily a misinterpretation, but a lack of thorough understanding about even the deity Amo representing ammonia fertilizer mm, mm. yeah that would make sense had this pantheon of deities that could have been representations of ancient chemicals that has that, now been i mean lost. that makes a lot of sense to me that that you would deify something as powerful and central to your civilization right it's like right. what like i think with it the, i think that we in the west have have largely misunderstood what the ancient people meant by gods and right. um and I think that that leads to no end of confusion for making sense of the records that we do, like the rare records that we actually do have access to. What's really, really uh, interesting. 100%. Go ahead. What's really interesting is that I'm, I've been looking at the, the canonical interpretation of the availability of iron in ancient Egypt. And they've found some iron artifacts, but they're like, they must have been from a meteorite. Yes. And so there's this there's this idea that they had iron, but it was iron that they like collected off of the ground that had fallen from the sky. And that to me seems yep. like it's probably an incomplete story because do you know do you know the work of Mario Bildrips? M- Mario Bildrips? Yeah. You big YouTube channel. Yeah. Yes, yes, I've heard of that. So he, uh, when he came on the show, he made this really interesting point where he's like, look, these metals wouldn't survive out in the open for the amount of time that we're, we're like, if we're looking 8,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago, most of the metal would have degraded in the time that it takes for us to find it. And so the evidence right. of metallurgy is is something that is continuously being erased from the rock record. And so it's like, it's a claim that doesn't have material evidence associated with it in the form of physical, like metal objects, but the, the, the evidence in the rocks and the the accumulation of these minerals nearby to these, to these locations does certainly seem to suggest that there was, there's an active process of concentrating it from the landscape. Yeah. We even had like a NASA scientist come on the show who was saying, essentially, if our civilization were to just disappear tomorrow, that basically what you would have is huge piles of minerals where our cities used to live, you know, where we used to live in the cities. And there's, there's very little, ways there's very few ways of discerning structures after a certain amount of time and honestly anybody's just left a gone out in the country and seen a car that's been sitting out in a field for 50 years it's basically disintegrating already so you know and to, to give you something that you may never have heard of in regard to the egyptian pyramids so inside of the central pyramid that we're looking at here this diagram there's an intrusive passage right here that leads into the core bedrock of the structure. So all of the pyramids were built on a mound of bedrock. That mound of bedrock is filled with iron oxide. Hmm. 
And I have video of this on a recent video that just came out on my channel where I look up into this hole and I shine my headlamp into this hole and you can see the prolific deposits of iron oxide inside the core of this pyramid. So to imply that the architects and builders of these monuments were not aware of these metal deposits is, is absolutely crazy because they intentionally chose places that were strategically filled with these deposits of metal. And it, the Giza Plateau is filled with these convergences of veins of iron oxide that also have gold and silver and a variety of other very valuable metals that are converging into the core bedrock upon which these monuments were built. How, uh, and my how, friend so Yusuf... I want to know about ahead. these... How deep are these deposits? Like, are they on the surface? Yeah, so you, you, can, you can see them on the surface walking around the entire Giza Plateau. But there's also very large pits that descend, you know, anywhere from 10 to 30 feet down into the ground. And I have video of this on my channel as well, where you can see these acidic erosion patterns indicating, again, fluid movements pouring down into these pits that are just filled with this massive deposit of iron. And they're all over the Giza Plateau. You can see them on the surface. They are particularly concentrated near the southern side of the eastern temple of the central pyramid. That entire area is a massive deposit of iron oxide that, again, converges into the core of the pyramid, but also branches off into these pits that are located directly next to a structure that I'm hypothesizing was producing acids for heap leaching and mining. So it certainly makes sense that this was a, a large industrial scale manufacturing complex that was producing the products that were required to extract the metals from these natural deposits. And of course they had access to iron. There's all, there's so much evidence that they had access to iron or at least knew about it and were using it for other compounds. You know, again, the, the staining inside of the red pyramid of Dashur being permeated with all of this iron oxide. Yes, there is natural iron oxide in the bedrock and in the limestone blocks themselves, but they certainly would have also had the capability of producing sealing compounds and other products that were infused with iron. And we've actually discovered the coating compound on the outside of the red pyramid also contains iron oxide, but it had to be created into this coating compound. It's not naturally occurring. It's, it's, well, I'll get to that chemical analysis here in just a sec. Um, so moving from ancient Egypt into Ireland, there is prolific evidence of the connection between the ancient Irish and the ancient Egyptians. And I knew that there was something special about these passage chamber structures in Ireland. So there is a reaction called basically the oxidation of marcasite or iron disulfide to produce a compound called green vitriol, which is ferrous sulfate, a very, very useful chemical. Also, I can go back. There's so much stuff that I haven't even covered. I'd so one of the byproducts of the manufacturing of the hydrochloric acid inside of the central pyramid is sodium bisulfate. Sodium bisulfate, specifically sodium metabisulfate, is very useful in precipitating gold that was dissolved in a solution of aqua regia. So once you dissolve your gold into hydrochloric and nitric acid, you have to get that dissolved, dissolved gold back out somewhere. It's, it's called dropping the gold or precipitating gold out of a solution. So SMB, sodium metabisulfate, is used to precipitate gold that's dissolved into a solution of aqua regia just happens to be the byproduct of what was being produced inside of the central pyramid. Same thing with ferrous sulfate is also used in the gold production world to drop gold out of a solution. So I started investigating Newgrange, the ancient passage chamber structure in Ireland. So I just want to introduce you to this reaction sequence very quickly, and you'll see why that will be relevant in just a second. So your initial reactant is iron disulfide. 
and it is oxidized in a heap leaching process with oxygen and water. This produces ferrous sulfate and sulfuric acid as a byproduct. So you stack your iron disulfide into a heap. It gets oxidized by moist airflow containing your oxygen and water, and it slowly becomes oxidized to produce ferrous sulfate. This green material here, which is also known as green vitriol by the medieval alchemists. And this was one of the predominant chemicals that was being produced by these ancient chemists. And it's a very slow process where this iron disulfide is oxidized into ferrous sulfate. So again, just remember the chemical reaction, iron disulfide, oxygen, and water producing ferrous sulfate or green vitriol. So now we come to the curb stone of Newgrange. Mm. And this is one of the favorite, my favorite discoveries. Again, I believe this to be the truth of the interpretation of these symbols. So there is a huge stone out in front of the opening of the monument Newgrange. And it is covered with these very mysterious inscriptions that to this date, no one other than myself has proposed an explanation for this other than them being magical symbols. So we basically see a bunch of spirals. It kind of looks like a burbling stream or, a, I don't know, like a bunch of vortexes, vortices. Yeah, yeah. So there's, there's a variety of different symbols on this stone. And one of the hypotheses that I propose in my book is that ancient magic is chemistry from the perspective of an uninitiated onlooker. So if you're a chemist and you take us two clear solutions, you pour one clear solution into your other and it turns red, boom, that is ancient magic. If you take some metallic powder in your hand and you light it on fire and there's all these colorful sparks coming out of you know green fire or blue fire or whatever it might be, this is ancient magic. And you hear about these stories of ancient magic from mythology across the planet. And this mythology comes from the onlookers, the people viewing this ancient magic who did not understand that this was a practitioner of chemistry. So, of course, these are reported to be just magic symbols. And there's, oh, there's no interpretation of this. So if you look here on the far left side of the stone, there are some polygonal diamond looking squares here on this far left and there's actually three there's one here there's one here and there's one here three distinct squares here on the bottom of the stone there are these undulating lines moving from right to left across the stone here in the center we have a large triple spiral symbol and we have some spirals moving in from right to left here. And then there's another diamond shape here, but it's different than this one. This one here on the far left is a similar, similar shape, but you can see this one is more of a crystalline form than this one here on the left. And then you also see a radiating pattern here in the top right. Okay, so remember the chemical reaction that I just described, where your iron disulfide is stacked into heaps. It is oxidized by moist airflow, water flowing in here, and air circulating inside of the chamber, transforming it into crystalline ferrous sulfate which is the product that you can see here on the far right of the stone. Hmm. This stone is literally an ancient depiction of a chemical reaction sequence. This is an instruction manual that was left by the builders of this monument to depict the chemical reaction that was once occurring inside of this structure. What's the significance of the radiations? Uh, we'll get to that in just a minute. Very good yeah. question, sir. All right. So again, let's go over here. Iron disulfide on the far left, oxidized by circulating oxygen and water. Water moving in to the passage, air circulating throughout the chambers, transforms your iron disulfide 
into crystalline ferrous sulfate. So here's an overlay just showing these images more clearly. So your marcosite or iron disulfide is stacked into the heaps. And we're going to apply this to the configuration of the chamber here in just a minute. This is your circulating air moving into the chamber, your water at the bottom of the stone, and the crystalline ferrous sulfate, which is a water-soluble product that can be removed in an aqueous solution and then distilled to produce crystalline ferrous sulfate. So now we look at the configuration of the passage chamber monument itself. It has a passage leading into a large vaulted reaction chamber that has three ancillary chambers, each that contain a small basin. This is describing the chemical reaction sequence that I just explained, where the iron disulfide or marcosite is stacked into heaps in the basins. That airflow flows, they literally describe it as an air intake at the opening of the monument, flows into the structure, picking up water as the water fills the chamber here. The air flows into this vaulted chamber and the triple spiral symbol symbolizes the air circulating in the triple chamber system. There's three ancillary chambers and you have a triple spiral here depicting that moist airflow circulating inside of the chamber. That crystalline ferrous sulfate is then leached out of the structure as an aqueous solution, which is exactly what we have here in the, the heap leaching process that I've been talking about. Mm -hmm. So now the sun. So everybody knows that these ancient passage chamber monuments are aligned to the sun. And this is ancient chemistry, and this reaction took all year. And once a year, during the winter solstice, the sun shines into this chamber for several days surrounding the winter solstice. And I didn't put all the pieces together until, so 2017, I did my first trip to Egypt. 2018, I made a research trip to Ireland so I could see all these things in person. And it wasn't until I got back, it was almost six months after I got back, I stumbled across a research article describing the biohydrometallurgical UV production of ferrous sulfate, heptahydrate crystals from pyrite ple present in coal tailings. Pyrite being the same mineral as marcosite, iron disulfide. And in this article, they describe the conversion of Fe3 plus ions into Fe2 plus ions using ultraviolet irradiation. So the final step of this annual reaction inside of Newgrange to produce ferrous sulfate crystals was completed by irradiating the solution with ultraviolet light from the sun. And this is why it became an annual ritual for this civilization. And there was a huge celebration around the winter solstice because they had just completed a year long chemical reaction that was going to produce a chemical that was of the utmost importance for this ancient civilization. Because with ferrous sulfate, you can produce sulfuric acid and you can also create iron oxide to extract metallic iron. So then it dawned on me, all the pieces came together and I knew that I was looking at an ancient chemical reaction system that predated the construction of the Egyptian pyramids. Because I believe that these ancient passage chamber structures were constructed before the Egyptian pyramids. Mm. And there is an instruction manual sitting out front inside of the structure that literally depicts the entire chemical reaction sequence that I just described. The oxidation of your reactants that are stacked in these three heaps, the water flowing into the chamber, the moist airflow circulating out, and then you're collecting your crystalline product here that's being irradiated by the sun depicted on the top right of the stone. So this is just a depiction of crystalline ferrous sulfate here, which is a green crystal. And up at the top left is, is phosphorus because there's great mythology about a civilization called the Tua de Danan, this ancient mythological race of gods that once inhabited Ireland. 
and they are reported to have ancient magic, which we just discussed was actually chemistry. And there's a weapon called the Spear of Lu that was said to had to be kept submerged in oil to keep it from spontaneously igniting. And that is exactly what you have to do with a phosphorus compound, because if it is not contained in a jar of oil, as soon as you take phosphorus out, and it starts to get oxidized by the air, it immediately spontaneously combusts. And imagine how terrifying of a weapon this must have been for this ancient civilization getting attacked by these weapons. It would have been absolutely terrifying. So, of course, there's this mythology of these ancient magical weapons that were really chemical based warfare. Hmm. And there's, I mean, they still use phosphorus. I mean, phosphorus is one of the most awful weapons in terms of munitions right because it just burns at such extraordinary temperatures and it gets it's hard to extinguish with traditional means from what i understand absolutely so again you hear this mythology in the ancient world that it was written by civilizations that were unfortunately having to go to battle against this ancient godlike civilization but really they just understood chemistry hmm. and they were using chemistry for the benefit of the civilization and there's all of this mythology. Well, this is so the green lion. Okay, so this is how to interpret alchemical symbolism. Mm -hmm. So this is an alchemical depiction of a process of using ferrous sulfate, the green lion, to precipitate pure gold that has been dissolved in a solution of aqua regia. So you see down here at the bottom right, the sun's rays are not as prevalent. And it is being submerged in a solution here. Then your ferrous sulfate or green lion is pulling the sun, the pure gold with these irradiating rays, much more pure rays out of this solution. So again, this is an alchemical depiction of a chemical reaction sequence that's describing the precipitation of pure gold out of a solution of nitric or hydro, um, aqua regia hydrochloric and nitric acid mm, that's really fascinating i've seen that green lion in some of newton's writing actually uh, with eating the sun and so forth what's the significance all, of the of the red dots the red stars sorry so so that's open to interpretation so there are one two three four five six seven stars indicative of most likely the seven planets and all of these ancient civilizations corresponded astrological significance to alchemical reactions. Mm. And that is something I don't really get into on my channel or in the book, which is why there are astronomical, astronomical alignments for all of these ancient structures. For this civilization, they harnessed literally the power of the universe in the chemical reaction sequence. And this was later practiced by the medieval alchemists. So I don't believe this tradition was ever fully lost. It just went a lot smaller scale. So let's propose the ancient Egyptian pyramids were producing chemicals. There was a cataclysm around 5,300 BC, either a flood or earthquake pyramids go out of operation. The Sahara also begins its desiccation period where everything is drying back out the rainfall has stopped the saharan wet period is over there was a huge cataclysm so now the civilization that once inhabited the upper eastern sahara moves back around the nile river the beginning of dynastic egypt circa 3500 bc the cataclysm has subsided the great flood is over the civilization moves back to the nile river where we have the normal palette in the beginning of dynastic egypt circa 3500 BC. The knowledge of chemistry still existed and they were still using this ancient science, but just on a much smaller scale and only by the initiated few that still protected this lineage of ancient chemistry. And this is just a depiction of this ancient godlike civilization, the Tuatodonon. Okay, so this brings us to the coding compound that was discovered on the exterior casing stones of the red pyramid. So do you see this material, mm -hmm. this red layer of material here? Yeah. So this is a casing stone that was on the outside 
of the Red Pyramid. And I didn't even know about this until about a year ago. And this was sent to me by colleagues at the Acida Project that took samples of this material. And it was a coating compound that once covered the entire exterior of the Red Pyramid. And the chemical analysis of this is it's a compound that has silicon and sulfur. So the calcium and oxygen are most likely from the limestone itself. The silicon and sulfur are part of the coating compound. And there's also a little bit of iron in here. So when investigating the properties of this compound, I discovered another research article by the Royal Society of Chemistry that's describing a process for coating surfaces with a copolymer made from sulfur and dicyclopentadiene. So dicyclopentadiene is a molecule that could be substituted for the silicon dioxide. And so after a simple curing process at 140 degrees C, the material was rendered insoluble and resistant to acids and solvents. So the coating was also repairable with surface scratches removed through the application of heat. So this is again, the Royal Society of Chemistry that has an ancient lineage that connects directly back to the medieval alchemists that are investigating coating compounds that have very similar chemical composition to the coating compound that was discovered on the Red Pyramid. And this brings me to this spectacular image that I found on a mural in a hotel dining room in Luxor. And let me describe to your listeners exactly what we are seeing here. So there is a large pyramid that is completely painted red, which is exactly what we see in the coating compound on the outside of the red pyramid. This entire structure was painted red, and it would have taken hundred of thousands of gallons of this coating compound to paint the entire structure. Out in front of this pyramid, there's water and a huge flood and a boat filled with animals. Okay, so now we're talking about the proverbial great flood, this cataclysm that brought the Egyptian pyramids out of operation, a mm -hmm. cataclysm or a flood of some sort. You have to see it at the top. I originally thought that this was a cloud floating in front of the pyramid. But if you look at it, the top of the pyramid is actually being blown off to mm. the side. And this is gas escaping, escaping out from inside of the structure. So this was in a, a mural of a hotel dining room. And someone not only had to commission this piece of artwork, but it also had to be approved by someone. You have to imagine the corporate, the corporate approval chain in a large hotel. Somebody wanted to depict exactly what was going on in this ancient civilization. It's, it's a pyramid, completely red, a bunch of gas escaping out from the inside, and the proverbial great flood with a boat full of animals out in front of it. Have you found the artist? So I, I tried. So I looked and tried to find like a signature somewhere on this mural. And let me tell you, this was one of the strangest things that I have ever seen because there are a series of these women that were painted on this mural that were like half animal, half creature, kind of reptilian looking, you know, whatever. I try not to get into all this type of stuff, but there was a very strange series of women that were depicted on this mural. And this is in the back corner, like back behind the maitre d' stand. And this is a very small mural was covering the entire dining room of the hotel. And this little thing was back in the corner. And this was during my 2017 research expedition where I'm just kind of beginning to have the idea that the Egyptian pyramids were producing chemicals. And then I stumble across this mural where there's gas escaping from the inside of a pyramid. So like we said before, there are people who are in the know. Well, sometimes and people don't even know they're in the know. You know, sometimes sometimes these stories stack up in a way that, you know, for an artist, you're always tapping into something that you're not totally aware of where it's coming from. And especially if, if stories and mythologies converge upon these features, the, 
the real significance may be even lost upon the artists that are creating them at some point. So again, I, I wonder again, what was, what was a, the inspiration for this? And again, the corporate approval chain, because before somebody paints a mural on your hotel dining room, you're going to want to see a sketch and know exactly what they're painting on the dining room. And so the protection of the pharaonic burial narrative is super important. So again, who approved this? Who saw the sketches and said, yes, this is exactly what we want in our hotel. This is what we want depicted in the hotel dining room. I found this to be just incredibly unusual. Do you, and, uh, do you, do you find evidence of pyramids with their tops blown off anywhere? So this goes into the investigation of the lost pyramid, um, which is a very, very unusual site that appears to be most likely completely destroyed. Um, it was recently excavated by the Ministry of Antiquities back in, I believe it was 2017. And the top of this pyramid has been completely removed. I see. And, and there's, there's no telling what really actually happened to this structure. And I haven't seen, not, not necessarily, well, I almost said something which was incorrect. There's a structure called the Headless Pyramid in Saqqara, which they call it the Headless Pyramid because the top of the pyramid is completely missing. And there's no telling what was originally there. But the, so yes, to answer your question, there is certainly some evidence of pyramids that have been destroyed. Hmm. That being said, the conventional explanation for this is that they were quarried. That a later civilization came around, took all of the blocks off very methodically and systematically, you know, removed everything and repurposed it for later constructions, which there's, there's certainly some evidence of this happening. And so again, I'm trying to wrap up quickly enough so we can get done real quick. So this is the machine that produces the electromagnetic energy field. We tested the properties of limestone, black basalt, red granite, and quartzite crystal on this machine. And long story short, I just did a video on my channel discussing the production of ultrasound in the red granite. So the electromagnetic energy flows into the red granite. The quartz crystal inside of the red granite is activated by the electricity in the electromagnetic energy field. This is exactly how an ultrasound machine works today, where you put electricity into quartz crystal. The quartz crystal produces very tiny micro vibrations, which produces ultrasound. That is exactly what was happening inside of the Egyptian pyramids. For example, the antechamber of the Great Pyramid of Giza is completely constructed from red granite. It was an acoustic catalyst chamber where the electromagnetic energy was flowing through the limestone into the red granite. The quartz crystal inside of the red granite was producing ultrasound inside of this chamber. As the sulfur dioxide gas gets pulled through the antechamber, it is further oxidized by this acoustic property it's called sonochemistry, sound chemistry, acoustic catalysts. And these are built into the structures to further convert these chemical reaction process. So your sulfur dioxide is transferred, transformed into sulfur trioxide in this acoustic catalyst chamber. And we also, so my, the second experiment that we did, I had him carve pyramid shapes because I wanted to see what happened at the top of the pyramid. Because there's been a lot of speculation about stuff coming out of the top of the pyramids and then being able to transmit energy and this, that, and the other. And I was expecting a huge stream of electricity to shoot out of the top of the pyramid into the copper wire. But that's exactly the opposite of what happened. The discharge. So with the limestone, you'll actually get a discharge of electricity into a copper wire. Limestone is a dielectric material. And it allows a discharge of electricity into a copper wire that's placed in proximity to the limestone itself. But as you go up the top of the pyramid, the discharge disappears completely. And this is because of the lack of surface area at the top of the pyramid. Mm. The pyramids are literally designed with the pyramid shape 
to harness the electromagnetic energy and keep it inside of the structure so that none of it gets dissipated out of the top. It was kind of exactly the opposite of what I expected to happen. Again, I was hoping that there was you know, a big, huge blast of electricity that shoots up into the copper wire, but it's exactly the opposite of what happened. But it makes a lot more sense that you would want to focus that energy to the inside of the pyramid to facilitate the chemical reactions and not have it dissipate out of the top of the structure. So that, ladies and gentlemen, concludes. So what are we at? Almost eight, nine, ten, almost four hours. Yeah, so it's 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 cool stuff. Can we uh, can we cancel your screen share so we can uh, wrap this down? Oh, yeah, yeah. So thelandofchem.com. If you want to support the channel, the Land of Chem on YouTube. I have Land of Chem merch. After my appearance on Johanna James' channel, um, the original first print copies of my book are completely sold out. Um, reprints are already in the works. It should be ready when it's ready. And I'll also be releasing some very, very rare signed copies of the few copies that are left of the original purple metallic foil and purple orchid paper interior color. Um, when we went to design the reprint, the purple, purple orchid paper doesn't exist anymore. Uh, so it's it's going through kind of a redesign with a new color scheme, um, but I do have a couple of copies of the original purple purple orchid paper that I'm going to sign, um, which there's maybe five signed copies in existence, and this is a picture of the original print with the purple metallic foil on the cover. Mm. It is absolutely gorgeous. Yeah! Wow, man! <laughs> wow, I was uh, I, maybe I should have been. Yeah, I was not expecting. Uh, I mean, actually, I kind of wa was. I, I just after watching a few of your videos, it's uh, it's so careful and interesting. And again, I'm not saying it's correct. I honestly have no idea, but it seems p possible, and that's what's really exciting about any theory to me. It's right. That's really all I ever look at in science. Is I'm like, does does this mechanism seem like it could happen? You know, and then after that you know, you can, each person can take their own experience with different theories and weigh them out however they want. But this is, um, yeah, it's really fascinating. So I, I, you know, obviously we've done a lot of time here. I want, I really wonder if you're going to turn your attention to like the Mesoamerican periods, uh, pyramids in the future or, or some, Gobeki Tepe. Yeah. Some of the, some of the other regions of the world, obviously you have your hands cut, you have your work cut out for you, you got your hands full, but, uh, is that in the future for you? Yeah, so I can I can already go ahead and tell you about Teotihuacan, for example, and there has been some evidence that there was some liquid mercury running underneath of this pyramid, and there have been so many people that have already speculated about something that I 100% agree with. It was used for gold processing, mm. so mercury amalgamation is a great way to again process gold. And we find in South America specifically, you know, you hear about um, El Dorado and the city of gold, and there is extremely high purity of gold, like 99.99% pure gold. And there is no way to produce this type of purity of gold by simple smelting process. It has to go through some sort of chemical extraction and chemical processing, which again goes back to exactly what we're talking about with the acidic compounds in the Egyptian pyramids, but you can also use mercury. There's also been some speculation that there are pyramids in China that have this same liquid mercury system running through them. Mm. So this gold processing was prevalent in the ancient world for whatever people like to speculate about what they were using this gold for. I don't know if you're familiar with monoatomic gold, but that's something that comes a lot, comes up a lot on the channel. And the work of Lawrence Gardner talking about the Ark of the Covenant and the production of monoatomic gold. Uh, very, very interesting stuff. And I don't get into necessarily that type of speculation, but dude, I've been down all the rabbit holes. And, and I think we're going to see a lot of talk about the Chinese Mesoamerican connection soon. There was a crazy finding yesterday that Anastasia showed me about it was, it's really just a relief carving found on what is it, a temple somewhere in uh, China that is unmistakably Mesoamerican. I mean, it's just, I, I'm no expert, but you don't need to be. It is quite clearly a Mesoamerican god. 
and yeah. or the Mesoamerican or the gods Mesoamerican or Chinese go- gods. Yeah, there you, you know? go. That's it's probably like, more likely uh, given the yeah. migration narrative. The, the crazy thing about ancient history is that you hear over and over again the story where there was like a farmer in his field and he started finding weird stuff and he called the archaeologists and they're like, my God, there was a city here. How weird. Yeah. And I feel like the 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 space that we have actually discovered of what used to be on this planet is so limited. And our tendency is to take the limited number of discoveries that we have and to assemble them into a picture that reflects the people that we think they were. Right. And as we start to discover new things, we start to come up with this kind of really tense and inescapable conclusion, which is like, I think our stories might not be accurate. Or complete. Or complete. Anywhere near complete. Maybe. Exactly. And so you're 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 at this vertex of so many different disciplines and really pushing forward our our ability to think of ancient civilizations not as being fundamentally different in needs and desires and implementation from ours. Perhaps the strategies were different, but physics is physics and it remains constrained by how these reactions work and the raw materials that you need and the materials that we continuously over and over invent because they are what can be made from the chemical limitations of the planet. And so... This is still such a nascent field, but I see I see your future as just being someone who like, accumulates all of the knowledge and by virtue of not being burdened by, you know, the the academic system where you're like frantically writing grants and you have only access to this one thing and your entire career is based on on this minutia thing that you're exploring, you're free to be able to put these stories together into something new and that is that is that is what this project is about and so anytime that i find somebody who's doing this work i'm so thrilled because i know that the world is filled with people like you who are who are looking around and they're they're assembling the jigsaw puzzle of of the past and the present and the future and i just i i can't tell you how exciting it is to see a presentation that is both far out but so deeply responsible in the in the structuring of it, and so thank you, thank, thank you. you for that. Thank you. No, I, I really appreciate that. Um, I've been giving a very unique opportunity to do what I'm doing here, and you know, this is my life's dream. And even if I didn't have a book or I didn't have a YouTube channel, I think I would still be doing this because I absolutely love it. So to have the opportunity to share this with a wider audience. You know, whether it be through my book or YouTube or podcasts like this, it's again, I've been given a gift by God Almighty Creator to, to be able to to do this for the rest of my life now. And I, I abandoned everything that I knew so that I could come here and pursue this. And my intention is just to grip it and rip it and have fun while I'm doing this because I absolutely love doing this. And it's a process for dis- uh, discovery for me as well. Because every day I learn something new and what I thought might have been true might turn into something different. And it's, um, I love the story of like Darren Kuyu. Have you ever heard about the discovery of Darren Kuyu where the guy was like building a new basement and they go to excavate his basement and they tap into the huge underground city of Darren Kuyu? Mm. Oh, so that's, that's how this thing was discovered. It's this massive underground, basically city. Where is this, this guy was putting in a new basement. They go to d- dig down in his basement and they find this huge underground city. Where where and was it? So I believe it's in Italy. Okay. If I remember correctly. If if it's not, it's it's Malta. I think um, it's but Turkey. there are tons Turkey, of underground Turkey, there we cities. Go. That, yeah, yeah, Turkey. There you go. Um so again, there's there's no telling what still exists to be found. And I do sort of tread the line between the conventional story of dynastic Egypt and some of the things that I talk about tied directly into things that are very compatible with that story. And I I did all of this very intentionally. Again, my dad and his infinite wisdom and telling me to just tell the story as I think it happened. And I'm trying to paint a picture of an ancient civilization that was just full of knowledge. And I just did a, a video on my channel called There's Nothing New Under the Sun. What has been done will be done again. What's been done before will do again. It's, it's a very, very true proverb from the Bible that, again, I think that people like Fritz Haber and some of the other people that were responsible for the discoveries of our modern chemical revolution 
were most likely inspired in some way by their investigation of the Egyptian pyramids. Haber could have come on a vacation to Egypt the exact same way that I did, came in here, seen all of this chemical staining, smell of ammonia, came back and applied some of his knowledge of chemical engineering to say, hey, I'm going to build the machine that kind of works the way I think that this thing works. And he put all the pieces together and boom, we're making ammonia. So I think there's some very practical things that can be. So again, going back to the idea that these are temples of initiation that were designed to encode the sacred ancient knowledge of this civilization so that all of the future generations and civilizations that come along can study these things to extract the geometry and sophisticated mathematics and all of the things that went into not only the architectural design of the monuments, but also the internal engineering, it's things like simple pressure manipulation. It's a very, very simple piece of physics, but has immense applications, especially in once we take it into our modern world, what we can actually do with these things. So again, it was the same people, human beings making the exact same products that we still use today. The chemical manufacturing was done a little bit different, but it was all the same applications and all the same intentions. It's fantastic. So cool. Yeah. I really hope that we have the means to come visit you in person someday and have you show us around some of these places. It would be so, an so you absolute have an joy. Invite and it would, it would be absolutely my pleasure. If you don't come for a group tour, if you just want to come personally, just, just send me an email. We can stay in contact on Instagram or whatever. And again, I'm here to, to facilitate the process, whether it be booking you a tour. If you want a tour with me, I can set that up hotel accommodations, whatever you need. Um, I can take care of all that. Cause again, I've got some really good connections with existing tour companies that they do all the groundwork, airport pickups, providing meals, security, the licensed Egyptologist guide that comes with you that are basically silent guides on all my tours. They just go because they have to go legally speaking to be there on large tour groups. And I'm just the guy that, you know, brings the people in. So I'm happy to help in any way. Man, I, I hope we can do that. We're, we're still barely keeping the lights on here, but I, I think we'll get there. So we'll stay thank touch. you so much. Yeah, oh, you're, my pleasure. You're, you're so generous with your time and yeah, man, I really hope we can meet someday. Yeah, no, this has been an amazing conversation. One of the reasons that I chose to do this interview is because you seem like very intellectual individuals. And I looked through some of your videos. <laughs> That's an insult uh, where we live. <laughs> no, 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 your, your, commentary, your commentary and your questions were very, very genuine. And I appreciate the, not only somewhat the scrutiny, but also just being an open mind and willing to receive ideas that are really, again, it's, it's, it's way far out there. You know, I mean, this is as far out there as it gets, but there's some very legitimate scientists in these things that kind of bring it back to a more rational perspective. So I was very excited to do this. And um, I was just, I love hearing people's questions and, you know, some things that they get interested in in the theories and, oh, man, this is cool to talk about this a little bit more. So um, hopefully I didn't bore you to death with the presentation. Um, I hope it turns out well for the audio listeners as well, because again, that seeing the diagrams and seeing the staining and all that stuff really helps me to paint the bigger picture because without seeing the diagrams and knowing the specific engineering of the structures, it's very difficult to describe to just an audio listener. But that's also why I use the diagram so I can better, and I'm sitting here doing it with my hands and stuff like the audio listeners can, can see what I'm doing. But uh, yeah, no, it was, uh, it was a very good time. Yeah. It was fantastic. We'll, we'll definitely talk to you again down the line. We'll see you soon. Sounds good. All right. Take care, Thank man. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye. Bye.